Greetings, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Dreamscapes. Today we have our friend Milkman Dan from an island off the southern coast of Australia sharing beachfront property with the penguins. Uh, we're going to get right back to him in two seconds. Uh, for my part, would you kindly like, share, subscribe, tell your friends? Always need more volunteer dreamers for these uh, interviews, uh, viewers for the game streams, uh, people to purchase my books. Speaking of which, uh, 16 currently available works of historical dream literature, the most recent Dreams and Their Meanings by Horace G. Hutchinson um working on book what is it book 17 soon soon about halfway done with the audiobook on that and then we'll get the uh get the simultaneous release also um uh, all this and more at benjamin the dream wizard.com including downloadable mp3 versions of these very podcasts um brain fart also head on over to benjamin the dream and uh, join the community there trying to uh build up some folks that might want to become uh, sustaining patrons play play uh, De uh de medici to my da vinci i hope uh that's enough about me we'll get back to uh, milkman dan uh dan thank you for being here thank you for having me yeah we were i just realized we'd had like a 20 minute conversation i'm like that oh, we should have been recording all that um <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time. And we'll, just, we'll just jump we'll just pretend like we never stopped uh you were talking about uh dreams and where they come from and do they mean anything and i was explaining something oh shit lost my train of thought with all that the origin of dreams what it's thinking mm -hmm. oh okay so what dreams is as it relates to the subconscious so my personal opinion and and you know your mileage may vary and and other people have different theories but Mm -hmm. I, I personally believe, and I've come to believe this over the last three years specifically as I've spent more time and energy getting invested in this stuff. Um, I believe what we experience as dreams is more like what our raw, unfiltered stream of consciousness is actually like. And then, and, and that, that's like, mm -hmm. that's like that layer of what happens as things filter up from the subconscious and head towards conscious attention and then what we're experience, what we experience as our thoughts when we're awake is, is a more focused awareness of that stream of consciousness. And we kind of pick out things or follow different, you know, we can direct it more. So it's like mm. dream, dreams are more undirected stream of consciousness. And then conscious attention is directing that stream or picking and choosing where to focus our attention. Um, that's where I was going with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like that. I've, um, I've thought of um, kind of thinking like in that, in a similar sort of way, like, um, yeah, I feel like there's constantly like your, your brain's like a river mm -hmm. and the each thought is just a leaf floating down the river. And like when you're like awake and conscious, like most of the time you can sort of like choose which leaves to read, like little fortune cookies, pick them up out of the water and, read them and choose how long you read them before you just chuck it back in the river. For sure. Um, yeah. I've, but although I've experienced times where I've felt like um, I've had like no control over like essentially which leaves I pick up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was uh, uh, on LSD. So it was kind of understandable, but um yeah, or the, or, yeah, or what um, popped into my head when you're saying that is, uh, this one's a leaf, that one's a twig. Look, there's a beaver. It's like <laughs> we never know mm. whatever we never know what's going to be in there. Um, but also oh, that, yeah. and, and this is it, it, kind of what got us onto this tangent was was that we have a we have concepts and theories regarding thought, thinking, the process, mm. and we've it's taken us a long time to get where we're at in terms of kind of trying to understand it better and lots of different models for it, and we still don't really know what it is. It's one of those things where it's like we, we kind of have an idea of what it looks like or how it works or what it, you know, and, and um, we, we mm. use, even in science, you know, scientific terms, we use a lot of analogies. So a flowing river is an analogy links in a never ending chain is another analogy and or, or forking, mm. pa forking paths. Um, uh, where was I going with that? We, we do, we do think of thoughts in that manner of, of something, something that has three dimensions in some way, uh, you know, like a, in, in analogy to physical object, something that, you know, has, uh, but mostly it's got like a line or, or linear type of 
concept to it because it does feel like one mm. one thought to another we call them associations which is where we get the concept of free association which is i say x and your brain just pops up with y and you say it and then and that was a big part yeah. of, big part of uh some psychological traditions uh but that also does seem what uh, seem to happen when we're maybe just daydreaming in a way abstracted like because we can daydream we can fantasize specifically about a scenario it's almost like lucid daydreaming is, mm. is a way to conceptualize that we can imagine ourselves yeah. in a specific scenario undertaking specific chosen behaviors or we can let our mind wander we can do you know wool gathering or cloud you know uh, cloud gathering or whatever but lots of more analogies people use to try and describe what we're doing oh yeah um because because a lot of I've, it is... I've always been called a daydreamer it's um generally a pejorative though <laughs> Yeah, it can be. And it's usually, uh, but that's another thing too, is like, okay, so we're trying to conceptualize how thought, what it is and how it works. And then we start getting into, well, what does it look like to have different conditions? And then there is, so if we continue the analogy, say of the river and the leaves, um, mm. there are some people where the river they have flows uh, rather slowly. It's a very lazy river. Mm. It doesn't, doesn't have a strong current yeah. and there's not a lot of leaves and that's okay. It, their brain's not moving down now. now let's say it's moving so slow that it, 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 it it's just not as efficient at moving at all. And some people we'd say, you know, they just don't, they'd have, that might be an analogy to say maybe someone who's lower IQ, they can't process complicated things. They can't think quickly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways we might conceptualize that as a problem, mm -hmm. but let's say there's, there's an, a healthy average of the rivers moving along at a good pace. There's not too many leaves. And then you'd say, let's say the river is hitting a lot of rapids and it's flowing very fast down a hill and oh, yeah. it's cluttered with leaves. And then we might look at that and say, okay, that's kind of the, concept of racing thoughts we might find in mania uh, under the bipolar yeah. label so you, you can kind of extend a lot of these analogies to to fit and then there's also adhd which is like the river's not moving any faster than it needs to but there's so many leaves you just you and you can't stop picking them all up and that's kind of the adhd mm. thing might be one way yeah. one way to think about yeah. it it's fantastic analogy. Yeah, or, the, or you don't have a good uh, way to discern which are the important leaves to pick up. Like your attention's just sort of all over. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. And then you get some people where um, maybe they are. Oh, what's a good way to describe this? So maybe someone gets a bit stuck in an idea. And if we are using again this river analogy, um, maybe there's mm -hmm. a little eddy, a whirlpool, and those leaves are just spinning in a circle and, oh, they're, yeah. and they're perseverating or ruminating on that type of thing. And it's hard, it can be hard to break out of that too. They're, they're stuck looking at the same leaves over and over again uh, and they can't let it go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great analogies. But then again, these are all just analogies. We don't know what's actually happening. And all of that again, goes back to the mm. root of, well, what is, you know, does do dreams or dreaming have any relevance or the, any importance, any significance, anything useful we can draw from it? In a lot of ways, it depends on what do you think thoughts have potential relevance? You know, do you think it's possible to get at someone's subconscious experience that is informing their their choices in a way that they don't understand and if you can draw a connection between them it gives them more power over okay now i can make choices instead of those choices being made for me by powers beyond my control that are inside me but underneath uh because because i don't know what they are um yeah there's, mm -hmm. there's still people out there who think psychology is just a bunch of bs and they don't want to get their head shrunk by those <laughs> by those damn damn pill pushers you know that's <laughs> those cranks those quacks yeah yeah, yeah there's some the, people the brain sh the head shrinkers yeah yeah that's tough and you know um, i don't want to argue with anyone on that you know in terms of like I would argue they are wrong and I would debate someone on that subject saying look i think this has validity oh definitely when it comes to them personally I'm more like, uh, okay, you know, it's kind of like the dragging a horse to, to water type of thing. But even if you could, yeah. what, is, what is it someone said recently? I think it might have been Peterson. I think about that guy all the time. He's a great, great example of a good clinical psychologist. Um, mm. He said, you know, court mandated therapy for, say, certain people who have had criminal contact with the law and the judge says, well, I mm -hmm. think you should get some counseling. You get those guys into counseling and if they won't engage, you cannot have any positive Im impact. They have to want it to work. They have to be willing to open up and yeah. they have to trust you and, and uh, be willing to, you know, critically self-examine and all this different stuff. And it's like, if someone's not willing to do that, there's nothing the the doctor can do. Uh, 
You know, it's like yeah. a patient that refuses to You can't to put a gun to their head and force them to yeah. open up and be honest or something. It's, it, yeah. And it's even worse than, say, someone who, who f- refuses to give consent to an appendectomy. At some point, that person will probably go unconscious and, and be at active risk of dying. And at that point, you can say, well, they're not fighting back anymore. Now I can go ahead and do do the operation but even even in that sense if it's mm. a physical problem and you can physically restrain the person you can take out a rotting appendix and uh save their life it's not the same way yeah. with getting into someone's head they have to open the door and let you in there's there's no physical method to break in there and and accomplish therapy against their will it's just not gonna it's a literal impossibility right now now maybe that'll mm. change someday and maybe we'll say uh that's a scary thing too. Like what if technology progresses to a certain point where we can enter someone's mind against their will and force them to change it, to believe something different or to behave differently. If that, that's a scary thought, if that becomes possible, is it ethical to do so? And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and there's, there's a, there's, there's the serious potential for, I go all over the place. Sorry. I got my, my river is, mm. is flowing fast with oh, like, no, lo- no. lots I'm, of leaves. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Like, I hope so. You need, I mean, jump in anytime. Mm. Um, I could see I mean, there's the, the, the overarching ethical concern. That's fine. There's also a best and worst case scenario, best case scenario. We've got someone who is as, as I've had customers in the past who told me precisely this, I hear the mm-hmm. voices of demons. They scream at me and it terrifies me and I want it to stop. Help me. And so we give the medication and it makes the voices go away sometimes or whisper, mm-hmm. whisper more quietly in the background. It makes them easier to understand or easier to ignore. It makes the voices feel less terrifying. Mm-hmm. All of that stuff is good. Now, what if we had the technology to go in and say, you know, this person's asking for help. We have their consent. We have the technology. We can go in there and just flip that switch and say, Hey, you don't have to hear screaming demons anymore. Hallelujah. That's win-win for everybody. Um, then there's the other side of it where a person is also schizophrenic person, but they're like, Mm -hmm. these aren't demons, they're angels. And they tell me I'm Jesus and I need to save the world by blowing up a bunch of people at a shopping mall and I don't want your help. I'm right. These voices are real. I'm, I'm a servant of God. And now do we go in there and change their mind, um, against their will? I mean, do we or not? Uh, and then, and then even worse than that is the idea of, well, we just, you know, we are the government and we think you're having wrong thoughts. So we're going to change what you believe so that you, uh, accept us as your Lord and savior. That, yeah, that will also become possible under those conditions. <laughs> that's the most worrying um, one for me is if like it yeah, becomes something that the government can just decide like a citizen needs. It's very sort of like 1984. Ah, uh, yeah. And it's scary because like on worst days, I feel like um, we're heading that way a little bit, but usually I'm, I don't know. I'm pretty yeah. op- uh, optimistic. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a, um, good question. Like, yeah, it seems unethical, but like if it would actually help them and if it was, you know, a proven possible thing to just like, del- you know, go into someone's brain and de- just delete the schizophrenia. So they're just, yeah, you know, it's a sane version of them. Um, I don't know. It's, it sounds like a, like a godsend to someone truly suffering, but also just a too dangerous a foot in the door, I guess, because, like, then you could start justifying it for other mental things, and then you could justify it for... Like, have you seen um, the movie um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? Yeah, that's a good one. That's exactly kind of the idea. Yeah. Uh, like Very interesting, too. I don't remember who was the director on that. I want to... Was that a Tenet movie? Uh, what is his name? Uh, like, Tenant. He did the movie Tenant and um, Inception. Was it, was it that guy? I can't remember his name. Damn. Um, Maybe not. Oh, Are you can look it up. That's go for it. Like I, yeah, when I'm doing this recording stuff, it. I can't. I can't uh, do research. Uh, typically, I may not. May not be the same. Michael but, Gondry. Gondry. What else? What else did he do? Because he's. I know he did something else recently that. I, um. I'm not too sure. It says uh, the Book of Solutions, Mood, Indigo, The Science of Sleep, Be Kind, Rewind. The Green Hornet, Eternal oh. Sunshine, yeah. Okay, maybe I was thinking of something something else or someone else, some other different director. That's fine. I That's a great one, too. It. Very interesting the way they conceptualize that is that the, 
the the technology kind of worked but ultimately didn't like those thoughts kept getting unearthed and rediscovered and the the it never really if i'm remembering it correctly like they they had a hard time the process mm. being with the process being successful and they even at the end of the very end of the movie like they had both deraced each other oh spoilers uh three two one uh, yes yeah, right yeah yeah yeah. if anyone hasn't seen it, it's like a 20 year old movie at this point but still um oh yeah true right but still i don't want it so but uh, give, give me 10 mm. 10 seconds and tune back in even though at the very end of the movie they'd both erased each other they met again and the attraction was still there and they were about to start it all over again if i'm remembering it correctly okay yeah okay yep. Spo- spoilers over you can come back <laughs> um yeah and that's uh I, I, I really like that like um not usually a huge sucker for happy endings. Like I, I I'd rather sometimes uh, just for it to be interesting that it's just be a sad ending. But um, yeah. yeah, that I felt that movie. That did. I don't know. It was just the whole thing was strange. Like, that, but interesting. That did feel like a happy ending to me too. Like they were both making yeah, a terrible yeah. mistake, and then there's, I mean, there's deep. And they knew it, and they knew they were. Yeah. Like they both heard that. Like you know, they they, despite knowing that, it hadn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, and I get that a lot. I get a feeling a lot, like a lot of times through my life, I've had a feeling of I'm making a huge mistake, but I don't stop. I just keep walking in t- towards the fire. Like, yeah, it's a strange, it's a bizarre, like, sort of feeling. It's almost like I, I'm, I become aware for a second that I'm not even in really control of like my life sometimes. I'm just floating through it. Like, it's weird. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And then uh, that, oh, so many great, great places to go with that. I mean, there's the idea of, um, you just speaking of that movie in general, it's like, should we ever really even want to forget relationships with people? I believe no. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a little bit on that line. Now that's interesting too, because we are, our brains are kind of programmed to forget a lot of stuff. And it's actually can be very beneficial if something is severely traumatic that maybe you don't think about it every Mm -hmm. time, multiple, every day, multiple times a day. That's just disruptive uh, to, to, to living a a, a good life in general. So there's, there's a benefit to the, say the natural letting go process and that, that, you know, mistakes we've made in the past that we're horribly embarrassed about, we're able to make a bit of peace with it and not, obsess over it every single day i've actually heard it said by some people who have photographic memory that people tell them man i wish i had a photographic memory and they say no you don't Mm. i cannot forget anything and it's awful yeah and now that doesn't mean it can't be useful uh, but is it worth living that way you know to what uh not to what end but to at what cost is kind of kind of the idea so it's not, yeah. you know, it's not necessarily, but then artificially forcing ourselves to, cause you, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, breakups are painful and it can be miserable to think, I, I wish it could have worked out with this person. Uh, but oh, where am I going with that? Um, but if we give it time, generally that the intensity of that distress will fade away. So it's almost like you just haven't given enough oh, yeah. times and you're trying to, it's, it's like interrupting a natural process. If you can naturally forget, that's great. If you can come make peace with it, mm-hmm. you know, give it time. No problem. If you have to go in there and kind of artificially zap neurons and, and delete memories, probably a very bad idea because you don't know what those are connected to. I think it's an unintended consequence type of thing where it's like, yeah, you had good intent. I want to alleviate unnecessary suffering perhaps, but Mm. You have changed as a person from that experience. And each one yep. of those things that happen to you, like a forking neuron styles, you've got all these patterns in your brain that, and how, how is that going to disrupt those connections by deleting the source? You, you lose things. You can, re, uh, the, um, you make decisions. You can no longer reference the source of, you don't know why you feel or think that yeah. way anymore. So there's like, and again, we're, we're talking about theoretical, technology that doesn't actually exist be, you're yep. dead right though yeah, yeah. like um due to the fact that i think i think they even say it's um <laughs> it, he he says i think um uh it's on it, what is it on par with um brain damage he's like oh no no it is brain damage like, <laughs> yeah 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 i think i remember that zapping too. your brain like um we're deleting part of your brain essentially so like yeah i don't like think it would be a good idea like if the, if we had the technology i don't think it would be a good idea um 
for the reason that like it's it sounds dangerous at least in that at that point in the technology but just say it got better and there was no brain damage i'm still uh i don't know i'm a bit of a romantic or sucker of, or i don't know what it is but like I'd, i'm a big believer in it's better to have loved than lost than to have never loved at all because like yeah, yeah uh, broken hearts do hurt a lot but that you know they make us strong yeah and i think sometimes you have to go through a learning process and maybe if you failed relationships to get to a relationship mm. that works because you have sufficiently changed to become ready for that oh, yeah. functional relationship yeah. so it's very rare that anyone, you know, uh, yeah, what am I trying to say? There's a couple different cases. I'm always trying to be the most accurate I possibly can be. So there are conditions where, let's say, arranged marriage is, is one way to look at mm -hmm. it. You are told who you will marry. The, the selection has been done for you by people who know you well, and let's say they have good intentions, and they are very good at making a good match. Now you're married to someone that was chosen for you, and there's two things that can happen. You decide this will last for our entire lives and we will make it work, whatever that means, whatever we have to do mm -hmm. to, to make it successful. Or you can say, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel the effort to do so is what I want or would be successful. And you, you just quit and leave. And that's, it's kind of the condition for, for any marriage. It's very rare that, um, say someone, meets the love of their life it's the first boyfriend or girlfriend they've ever had they date for a while and then they get married and then that is the only person they have ever dated ever known that is their entire relationship mm. experience and the partner they stay with for the rest of their life it's much more common you have crushes and you ask a few uh, you know you go on a few dates and maybe that's not you know you're not having mm -hmm. fun and so you try a different person and maybe you say some stupid things or you you forget to buy some flowers whatever it is the other person expects and you're like well i guess i won't do that again and you learn from it you know i think that's much more common mm. in people's experience um I was oh yeah, going, I was going yeah. Are you gonna be <laughs> so like I, I think how you said with um the photographic memory thing, how people are like, oh, I wish I had that. I, that. I feel that's very much the same with um people who are like uh, high school sweethearts or whatever, or like first that's the first uh, relationship, and it just so happens to work. Like you know, people are like, oh, I wish I had that, but I'm sure, yeah, a lot of them do think to themselves like. Well, you may wish that, but I mean, like, I have that, and I kind of wish I had have lived a little before, you know, yeah. um, there's a settling little, down, I guess. There's a little bit of um, path not taken regret in some ways. Yeah, um, grass is greener sort of. Yeah, thing. I mean, you always wonder, yeah. and then it's a, it's a, sometimes we're left with no option to say, um, well, well, we're left with the only two options is, I'm going to stay on my side of the fence because hopping over is permanent there's no going back once you this yeah. so there's things you cannot as the internet says cannot be unseen there are behaviors that cannot be mm. undone and that doesn't mean we can't i don't what am i trying to say sometimes if let's say we go down the wrong road for a certain amount of time and then we realize that we're heading in the wrong direction and we turn around you can turn around and you can go back there's a lot of conditions in life that are like mm. that you can technically undo a mistake and then get onto the right path but you can never undo the fact that you went the wrong way first that that experience of going the wrong way yeah. will always exist that the existence of that thing will never disappear and that can be a good thing or a bad thing but it's also like some mm. of the some of the arguments being made about you know not to get too con controversial but some of the current debate over uh, children and medical procedures uh, lately yeah you know they'll say oh it's reversible it can be undone or if uh say breasts are mm. removed you can just get implants i'm like you can't get your breast back mm, yeah once they have been removed that is permanent now implants are a remedy that is a a second cosmetic uh, surgery an aesthetic an aesthetic remedy, an aesthetic guess, yeah. remedy but it's not this you, you know once you've cut off healthy body parts mm. they're not they don't grow back we're not lizards that's there's no undoing that is a permanent choice there's a lot of things that are like that in life it's like you know at the very least you can't get back the lost time like some people come yep. out of a movie and they're yeah, like, exactly. oh my God, I want that two hours of my life back. Never can't happen. Not it's permanent. <laughs> it's never coming back. It's gone forever. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's kind of where I look at a lot of, you know, decisions and sometimes you just got to live with that. But yeah. And it, and, and that's what it is. So, well, okay. All of this was a tangent from the grass is greener concept. So you make that decision. Of, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to choose to never know what's on the other side because that decision is permanent. There's no, maybe I can hop back over the fence. Maybe I can't, but there will never, 
There will never be a condition again where I have never hopped the fence. That's a that's a one, yeah. one time deal. It's like uh, you can never have your first time twice for anything. First time you eat ice cream. I was, cream. Say, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Uh, I was just about to say, yeah, you can never lose your virginity twice. Exactly. Yeah, that's a it's yeah. a one time deal, and uh, you know it, it's a personal opinion how important that is to you, and it may have other consequences. Yeah. But now, now then it's again, true. if if you do hop the fence, you might find it tremendously rewarding. You might go, "Oh my God, why didn't I do this sooner?" But that's mm. it's a one way street. You you can never unhop that fence, and and you got to be sure. Sometimes it's better not to know. You might to have that regret. Well, then again, some you know some yeah. people. Uh, yeah. What do they say? There's uh, they they surveyed some old folks who uh, were on their deathbed, and they're like, "What do you regret in your life?" And a lot of their regrets were, "I should have done more things I was afraid to do." Now that isn't quite yeah. hopping the fence necessarily, because I don't think they were referring to that. But a lot of people regret the things I should have traveled in Europe. I should have asked that girl out in high school. I should yep. have I should have seen what would have happened if I had changed careers. You know, but I was scared. They regret the things they didn't do. I didn't do, yeah. Not, yeah. So, not so much the things they did. Yeah. And I can, I can understand that. Like, um, they, like, I don't believe anyone should regret the things they've done if they have, um, like, if they've done bad things. Like, even that's you that's know, the if they've learned yeah. from it. If they've learned mm-hmm. from it, um, and they're remorseful and aren't going to do it again or whatever. Yeah, and then, it didn't um, hurt anybody you know, too badly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like like when you were saying before, like, um, you know, doing a loop sort of thing, like um, it, just using that, like um, I feel like when you do that loop, you can either like let it sort of um, drag you down and you come out of that loop, yeah, going forward again, but you're going slower. Or you can like sort of almost use it like going around a planet or something, like use the, what's the, what do they call it, gravitational slingshot or yeah. I don't oh, yeah, yeah, much yeah. sci-fi, but. Right. That's yeah, how they like that's how they traveled sling, back in time in Star Trek Four. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Like, I've so I've heard. I've, I don't watch much uh, Star Trek. I've, uh, Deep, I've watched a bit of Deep Space Nine, but um, I'm not a Trekkie by any means. Yeah, I've heard that was a pretty good series. I mean, I watched a little bit of it. I was more of a uh, original series and then Next Gen. Like, I'm old enough that I watched oh, yeah. I watched the very first episode of the Next Generation in 1989, and I watched it weekly every Sunday night when it was on until the very last episode, uh, like six or seven years later. Uh, that was, oh, a, wow. it was a big part of my life. Yeah. I was pretty young back then too. It was like 19, it was 1989. God, I was like 12 when it started and like, oh, wow. yeah, like 17, 18 when it, when it ended, something like that. That was a big, that was a big deal. Um, no, yeah. actually what you were saying too, but I love the gra- gravitational slingshot type of, uh, type of analogy, a lot of things. So what do we do with trauma? Like what is a, broad strokes this is not um the actual process but like the broad concept of it what do we do with someone who has trauma and why does trauma in 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 a ptsd way Mm -hmm. seem to continue to have lingering effects and and how do we then address it in a way that makes that negative life experience improves it you know broadly speaking and the, the 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 general concept is you've got to turn that experience into something useful you've got to get a grip on it in some way a lot of the reason our Mm. brains get stuck obsessing over negative experiences fear anxiety trauma of that kind is because our brains are literally designed to analyze negative experiences to figure out how to avoid them in the future we our brain wants to learn the pattern so that we don't re-experience that emotion that we don't you know suffer in the same from the same experience. Um, Mm. so a lot of the secret and again, broad strokes and, and, you know, correct me if you're a clinical counselor out there, but, but a lot of the secret appears to be making coming to coming to grips with it in a way that it becomes useful. You've got to transform the trauma into triumph is the, is the kind of, you know, catchy phrase phrase to it. Mm -hmm. But, but it is a process of understanding what, happened why did it happen how do i make sure that doesn't happen to me again and once you've got a handle on that it's a lot easier to kind of put it to bed and it's it's kind of related to the same thing we were talking about with um reoccurring dreams is that you know Mm -hmm. why do we why do they keep coming back because there's a lesson there we feel is necessary to learn our brain is saying this is a pattern it's going to happen again you better understand it and until you do you're going to keep having these dreams um yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. Going, I was going somewhere I, with all that. I reckon, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd um, 
I'd uh, agree with that. Like, um, I think, yeah, it's a uh, trauma happens to them. They like sort of, um, I don't know if ruminates the right word, but mm -hmm. they just let it loop in their head, essentially trying, well, trying to understand it and failing yep. and not being able to, um, I guess, um, either find uh, good help or maybe it's like a communication breakdown. They can't properly express like um, sort of, <laughs> you know, they can't properly um, verbalise their trauma or whatever. So like mm -hmm. the person treating them or whatever can't properly sort of like help them um, yeah. as well as uh, I think a lot of people, not, you know, I'm not trying to victim blame and I'm definitely not qualified in anything. So, <laughs> you know, my word take it with um, five metric tonnes of salt uh, but yeah, I reckon it's um, a lot of people don't want to properly verbalize it. I guess it's not that, like they don't want to, and it's not like they're intentionally not like um, properly, like or honestly. I guess I see. I don't want to use that word either because then it makes it sound like I'm saying they're being dishonest. But go, go, you've got my like, permission um, to say it wrong, and we'll figure out how to say it right. That's all good. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, all right, cool. Then I'll just um, blurt it out. I, I feel like um, they, um, like, I don't know, inside their head, they won't allow themselves to sort of, like, honestly open up to the um, therapist or whatever because there's a element of shame yeah. around part of the trauma. Like, I don't, you know, whether it's be like someone was, you know, uh, caught in a dark alley or someone was in war or, like, whatever's caused it, there's been some maybe, like, a good feeling in amongst it and that's tainted it and, like, made them feel, like, just pure shame about, like, the entire yeah. situation and they can't honestly say to the doctor or something like, you know, it's um this because they don't want the doctor to judge them or yeah. um think that they're, you know, a bad person because of that. Um, for, for sure. Yeah. There's, oh, there's a lot. You're, you're touching on a lot of really very real, very real things. So you're, uh, even if, if, if all you've got is kind of a rough layman's sketch, I mean, you're on to some, some, I think some very real things. Uh, part of it is, um, okay. I, I wanted to mention too, there's, there's an element to it, which is physiological. So we get our central nervous system gets mm -hmm. primed to respond very strongly to to certain things that are similar to past traumas so the classic example is yeah. the, the vietnam vet who comes back and a car backfires near him and he hits the deck because he thinks he's being shot at now he's suddenly yeah. embarrassed because he realizes it's just a car but his he was on the floor before he didn't even make the decision it wasn't like i think mm -hmm. that's a gun maybe i should get down no it's bang floor and whoop. yeah <laughs> i just <laughs> activated my mouse um so there, so that's a very real phenomenon and there are, you have to address the, um, in, intellectual, so to speak, layer of it, as well as the physiological. And there's a lot of things weird. Uh, there's a weird thing they show works, which is like certain tapping exercises that people can do when they're having physiological responses. And you can train that okay. to reduce that physiological response, which then allows you to say, maybe get a better grip over your thought process and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's one layer I wanted to throw in there too. I kind of as a bookend on my own my own comments earlier. There's a bunch of layers you mm -hmm. brought up too, which is the idea of there's almost always invariably a strong element of shame, and that's whether there also maybe a subset of part of me kind of enjoyed it, but I'm also ashamed of that, which can be, you know, and mm -hmm. that that can go for the um, rape victim who had an orgasm during the rape involuntarily yep. it's like why would that yep. happen why would i enjoy it in that way well that's not actually that uncommon it's not common mm. and it's not proof that rape is good or that she actually enjoyed it or would do it again or gave any kind of consent to the experience nor that it wasn't traumatic mm. but there's an element there that sometimes happens um but and that goes for that it goes for the well and, and for men as well i've heard that like um if a man's being um raped it's it's not unheard of for the like the victim to be to get an erection and that yeah. a lot of the time um makes the man feel like he well for shame because he feels like he well he must have enjoyed it mustn't he if, if he got an erection like he was obviously having a good time like when it's actually it can just be a um 
like a physical thing, like the it is, uh, it is. What is it? The male G spot or whatever on the butt. Uh, the, the you know that prostate uh, stimulation or something that, like that. Yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah, yep, exactly. Absolutely. It's a purely physiological response. So it's it's not like they're mentally like enjoying it or something. It's just yeah, pure reaction. But yeah. Yeah, no, exactly right. So that is mm. <clears throat> that is absolutely a component. And then uh, that you can only get to that kind of stuff and even discuss it and address it if a person, as mm -hmm. you said, is willing to open up to a a therapist and talk about it. And that means also that um, they've overcome the shame of of having you know post traumatic stress in the first place. Like, oh, I should be, yeah. I should man up and be stronger. A lot of people have had worse things happen to them and they're fine um, or they've they've been successful or they've managed to deal with it. But what I can't. So mm. there's so many layers of shame all built built into that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and, and there's also in some ways. Uh, what am I trying to say? Excuse me. I'm trying to say belch. Um, <laughs> there's also sometimes a reluctance to address things at all it's like if i can just in some mm. ways in some ways it's almost like a label. avoidance Avoid, uh, yeah, yeah avoidance lately and and there's some ways that that is and it's really tough to parse out too sometimes because sometimes it's like it is so intensely negative that i just can't bring myself to do it god i'd love to but it hurts so much and they can't force themselves to do it that's one kind of thing um mm -hmm. there's also a kind of thing where it's like if i could just forget about it and avoid it and and be fine i'd rather do that so they're reluctant to do the work to address it even if it were possible oh, yeah, and yeah. we're not you know so intensely negative that they couldn't couldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole so many layers of like how to connect with someone and what their experience and motivations are and this is just in one tiny slice of say dealing with someone who had specifically a trauma and then ptsd resulting from it and then their life is disrupted enough that they would even consider whether it should be addressed um yeah you know yeah and then we have a whole different well, yeah, <laughs> it's and, whole different and, issue like okay. some people might just need a bit of time from like almost like need to be separated sort of temporarily from the event for long enough to be able to yep. approach it even so there's like yeah i'm sure like with some people there's a period of time before yeah as you said ready to even face it but like yeah there'd be of course, other people that are like, well, uh, when I'm drunk, I don't seem to feel that bad or like that, yeah. whatever, and or like on drugs or so the avoidance can you know, be like pretty, pretty easily attained um, if you like are determined to not like uh, think about things. You can, yeah, it's it's far too easy. I think a uh, solution for that people use. Um, to avoid certain uh, trauma or whatever is to yeah just um oh yeah to be high all the time or and that is a, like that. that is a big source of say drug abuse is is you know not just because we're we're biologically susceptible to that kind of thing but what makes some people mm. able to quit more successfully than others part of it is uh, the the substance abuse is providing relief from something that is in their internal experience worse. Uh, I heard an old joke. Yeah. You might've heard me uh, or so, seen me cracking a little bit of a smile while you're talking about terrible things. Cause I thought of a joke that, uh, I, uh, you know, <laughs> people in the, in the military and people in the medical profession and psychology and whatever, we have a wonderful morbid sense of humor. Cause if, if you do not laugh, you will cry. And sometimes it's okay to cry, but usually yeah. you'd rather laugh. Um, the old joke is I'd rather have this bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. And that's, that's basically like <laughs> yeah. how people, I've can, heard that one. Yeah. yeah, how people conceive their choices in some of these ways. And it, it speaks to a very re real state of mind, which is, you know, the only way to solve this problem is to literally cut out the piece of my brain where the problem sits. Therefore, what am I going to do? I drink, sue me, you know, and, uh, that's, mm. it's a bit of a false dichotomy because, well, there's other ways to deal with it. You, well, yeah, I, I almost feel like there's a, like a meta like level of that, which is, well, drink enough and get yourself some Corsakoff syndrome and you essentially have given yourself the equivalent damage of like a frontal lobotomy. I've I've yeah. met a lot of people That's over true. my life uh, who have, as far as I can tell, effectively pickled themselves. Mm -hmm. Like their, their speech is constantly slurred. Um, they 
like have virtually no short term memory. It's it's amazing what a life of what I'm assuming is hard drinking um, can do. Uh, yeah, yeah, to the human brain, I guess. Probably preserves it though. Yeah, and so I mean, certainly preserves it for the person that condition. the person that dissects it later. Sure, it'll be well, mm, it'll mm. be well pickled. It just won't work very well yeah. while it's in your head. That's that's very true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, dementia is a wonderful cure for PTSD, right? <laughs> Just forget everything. Oh, totally. Except, yeah. Except it, it isn't uh, technically. Uh, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just joke in a joking. In all seriousness, it's not. In a joking way, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I am not a doctor, but this is also not recommended. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Do not go out and get early onset dementia if you're thinking it will cure your PTSD. Yeah. That is. Not That's so, uh, not so much. Not the best medical advice. <laughs> no. Nah. Yeah. There's better ways. There's better ways. Mm. No. And then a Bottle lot of, the a lot or, of, or the bottle or the, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where, uh, I don't know if you, if there was a movie with Sean Connery where he was just kind of a, uh, a bit of a pugnacious, contentious, combative type of person. He was very angry and he liked to argue and he, he, you know, what, what do you want to fight about it? He was that kind of guy. And they, mm. the whole film was kind of, what are we going to do with this? What's, what's, how do we medically approach this? It was a precursor from the sixties to what would, would eventually become one flew over the cuckoo's nest with, um, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, Jack Nicholson. Yeah, and yeah. they weren't like, like that, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest was based on a book, but this movie was, yeah. was earlier kind of dealing with the say late forties, fifties, when when they were trying to sort out, well, what do we do with this lobotomy thing? Is this good? Are we doing this? Is this medically? <laughs> is this an abomination or is this actually? Are we the baddies? Are we the baddies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. again, spoiler for now an eighty year old movie at this point, something like that. Um, yep. Or sixty, sorry, sixty something year old movie. Um, at the end of the movie, they gave Sean Connery a a, uh, a lobotomy. And you're like, and, and the way they set it up was like, he was finally captured and subjected to this against his will. And, and it was kind of horrifying. And then he, uh, he wakes up from the procedure and immediately mm-hmm. starts picking a fight with the doctor. You bastard. What did you do to me? It didn't work. Anyway, they did lo- lobotomy for nothing. It didn't change <laughs> his personality. So I think the overall yeah. message of the film was these are stupid. They don't work anyway. Why are we still doing this? It was it was almost I think it was a comedy in a way that the, the way mm. they presented it. Um so that was so that was a very funny end. Now the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was very different. Uh and again yeah. spoiler alert if anyone hasn't seen that, they lobotomize him and he's now just sitting mm-hmm. in a chair drooling. And again they're like is this is, is this, this better? Is this better? Is this preferable to just <laughs> no. let someone, you know, when they ask him, uh, you know, uh, why did you get put into this hospital? He's in group therapy. He's trying to open up or, or they expect him to open yeah. up. And he says, well, as I see it, too much fucking and too much fighting. Usually not at the same time. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can't. And, and then there was an open question of like, is, is Jack Nicholson's character in that, the what he portrayed from the book, was he personality disordered in a way of like, was he a sociopath and, or was he just kind of a, a different breed of man from maybe an earlier time where if he, like, if he'd been, uh, if he'd grown up in the Rome, Greek M, or Greek or Roman times, they probably would have just put mm. him, put him on the battlefield and he would have been a hero, you know, uh, they had a different standard yeah. for what, what it means to be a civilized man in society. Uh, and that's where a lot of our psychiatric standards come from, unfortunately. Um, and it's a very interesting question too. Like I, I don't get into a lot of the different tangents, but uh, you're great, you know, great to talk to on this cause you get it. Um, mm. It's a very interesting bootstrapped or circular argument that having suicidal thoughts means something's wrong with you. Therefore, we must treat you such that they go away. And that is a definitional argument. I mean, we might agree with it. We might say, yeah, it's ideal that humans don't want to kill themselves. But Mm. is it ever possible that someone could have those thoughts and it not be a disorder? Like, is there ever a rational reason to make that decision? And I, you know, I'm open-minded enough to say, I think there is. And, and that's recognized in say, I, I live in Portland, Oregon. We have a death with dignity oh, yeah. law and they've started that in Canada too. I think the Canadian thing is a mm-hmm. bit of a mess because the reasons they're doing it is 
we just can't afford to treat everyone. Have you thought about dying? And then they like offer that to people. Yeah. Like, we can't fix you. We don't have the money or the resources. So we'll kill you if you want us to. I think that's different than yeah. I have terminal cancer. It hurts everywhere. The drugs aren't helping. Like I'm, palli I'm like out. Palliative care sort of level. Yeah. 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 Palliative care. It's like if you've been on the palliative care for a while and those, you can develop a tolerance and it's not helping with the pain and there is no cure yeah. and you are just waiting to die painfully miserably. Yeah. At that point, I think anyone can understand that. It's when you get someone who's like a 16 year old kid and they say, I just think life's not worth living. And you're like, well, is that depression or are you being kind of a normal kid where you're a bit rebellious and you're like, everybody else loves <laughs> life. I screw it. I hate life. Okay. Well, that's a perspective. Yeah. You know, uh, what would we get? Well, goth kids. Teenagers you know, are angsty. Teenagers, teenagers are, are angsty. You know, emotional. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, that also connects to the idea of certain traumatic events that are normal. Your parents died. Yeah. That's yeah. trauma. I mean, even a divorce, mm -hmm. even a marriage. These are all hugely stressful events anyone says getting married isn't a traumatic event and so you're blending two house you're living with someone mm. uh, now you got to negotiate stuff now you got kids to in the middle and all kinds of it's extremely stressful being a married and with kids and uh, all that stuff and just trying to live your life but um mm. let's say a parent dies even if you're older and you were expecting yep. it and uh, that is that is a, a an unavoidable trauma that most of us are going to go through and it will take a certain amount of time to get over it. And you may never yep. get over it completely. Like there's always going to be something missing from your life. And then we have to look at that and say, okay, well, that's normal as well. So there's a certain, and, mm. and you know, you, you kind of pick yourself up again and get back onto a, a, a baseline and, and carry on with life mostly. And we would say after a certain yep. amount of time, if that's not happening naturally, yeah, we, maybe we got a problem and you hope, um, you hope someone wants to do something about it and, and get their, get their life back you know it's just you, your your parent died you didn't so what would they want you to do mm. you know in honor of them carry on and don't be miserable forever that's one argument to make to people but oh most definitely and um and it, and you're lucky if you know someone like in in need of uh like support if something like just say their parent had died um it's it's quite um manageable to sort of solve for one or like to support for one disaster but when you get them compounding so like that when you said that it actually just reminded me of um when my grandpa died so my mum's dad when he died that was within the same year that one of my mum's like two best friends also died mm. and she moved house so and like i think moving house, like buying a house or selling a house buying a house is like in the there's like in the top 10 i think yeah um yeah death of a family member death of a friend like buying a house selling house um i think uh, getting divorced there's like a there's a lot of like um major sort of um events that yeah i think people don't really um appreciate like how stressful they are like it's okay to find that a, a freaking hard time like um that's yeah. natural um, for sure. Yeah. No, this, and that's a funny thing. It's like some people don't realize how traumatic in that sense, normal. And by normal, I mean things that most people go through. Maybe most people will mm. not be, you know, rear ended, uh, by a drunk driver and, and have their partner die in the car. That's an, that's an out yep. of the ordinary, pre but getting married, moving houses, very normal, mm. ordinary things. So some people downplay those as not stressful because they're normal like, no no normal things can be very stressful uh but again, oh, yeah. as, as a kid normal uh you're uh asking a girl out for the first time never done it before ho ho terribly stressful but worth it normal mm. but not you know it's not like we can if she pretend doesn't it's not say stressful. yes i could just die like yeah it's just like yeah or if she does say yes i don't know which i'm terrified of more then then we have to go on a date and i don't <laughs> yeah, know what to true. do oh now i gotta i gotta yeah. do something about it this isn't just a crush. i'm signing up for more <laughs> awkward situations what am i doing not for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and yeah so however however normal something may be in terms of of how many people go through it it's yeah it doesn't make it any less stressful it's just being alive mm. is stressful in a lot of ways yeah yeah, you, and, um, you know, lucky are the people that find their own sort of um, life hack or whatever for dealing with it. So, like, for example, with um, – I, I used to do de uh, debating back in school and 
like in, really enjoyed public speaking, but it made me nervous as hell. Like the way people who um, have nightmares, essentially that they they wait, you know, they speak in front of their entire school or something, and they look down, they're in their underwear or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, I feel that I feel that terror, but I sort of re-channel it into like I almost like take that that ter- that feeling of terror and I re-channel it into like uh, excitement almost, yeah. and I'll like then just feed off that energy as opposed to sort of like let it paralyze me or worse like m- make me start um, stuttering or like forget what I'm meant to be saying or, you know, something disastrous. Like, uh, yeah, I can, I, I don't know how, but like yeah. some, I think it's got something to do with um, just not, just not giving a um, flying fuck <laughs> sort of thing. Um, yeah. In some ways you got to get past that, that care, caring. Well, the a phrase yeah, I heard oh, yeah. like 30 years ago uh, was you never get over stage fright. You just learn to like it. Um, yeah, which is yeah, 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 yeah. and then I think it what really you're do describing is very like I used to. Um, well, this well, what I'm doing now, talking to pe- recording and to put on the internet for everyone to make mm-hmm. fun of, so, so be it. Um, but I used to do um live performances now. Okay, so let's say I was 14 ish and I was a part of a okay, this goes even further back. So I think before my parents even had me, they were part of a group of dancers that performed at Oktoberfests. So then when I got oh, cool. older, when I got older, they were still doing this. And then I picked up playing the drums and it turns out that the, the little band that played for the dancers wanted a drummer. Mm. So they're like, Ben, you're, you know, the, our, the, you're the son of the dancers. So why don't you come in and, uh, and see if you can learn a few of these songs for us. And I did that for mm. a while, I think a couple of years. And we went to a bunch of different Oktoberfests all throughout, you know, September, October, um, mm. in the, in the California area. And then eventually, so, and that was terrifying. And I was always glad I was sitting in the back on the drums behind people. And no one, nah, no, hiding no, behind no, the rest of the band and the dancers. I, yeah. I got kind of a little, uh, eased into it a little bit and the dancers are out there and everyone's looking, no one's looking at the band. So I, I like, I, I get to feel like I was just in my own little world back there behind the cymbals and the drum kit. Um, and, mm. But then it, I transitioned into, well, I picked up the guitar and then I wanted to be a, a bard at Renaissance fairs and sing, sing songs. You crazy little bastard. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Come here. What do you want? I don't even know. It's so hard to know what he wants. You can see him. He's off camera. Yeah, I don't right? talk dog. Yeah. Come here. Um... Come here. Okay, he's gonna go eat some food. That's fine. I don't hmm. think he wants me to throw his toy or something. I don't know. It's hard to tell, uh, uh, right? Uh, anyway, so long story short, on that, and then I started playing solo, and it's like you get up there with the guitar and you start singing in front of a crowd of people. They're all looking at you. There's no hiding behind the drum kit. There's mm. no dancers. Yeah. And that would my leg, my, my one of my legs would just shake uncontrollably. I'd, I'd feel short of breath. Yep. And yep. after a while, that goes away and i think it's um it's a very interesting thing it's like humans are extremely adaptable so you get into situations which mm. raise your anxiety level to the state of physical symptoms the more you do yeah. it the more it um it's, it's like exposure therapy is what they what they'd call it broadly speaking yeah. the more times you do it the more successes you have at it the more you realize this is not a life-threatening situation that i need to have this strong reaction to and it you calm down and you make enough mistakes where it's like I screwed up and I was embarrassed and I didn't die. I guess I'll be okay. Yeah. You know, I guess it's not that big a deal. Um, you survived. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's a big lesson for the brain too, of like, I guess I can handle this. I guess this is because yeah. that's what a lot of our responses your, are. Your skin isn't that thin. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a sign that you, you know, can fail and that's fine. Like, you know, even if, you know, you well, in my case, to say I was, you know, uh, reading a, um, <laughs> like, you know, doing a presentation or something, and everyone just started laughing at me for, that's a, isn't that the weird thing? I reckon a lot of people in their dreams when they're having their, like, you know, nightmares of um, public speaking, Come I think in a lot of those dreams, and I'm just assuming here because I've obviously never had one of those dreams because I, I like public speaking, but um when those when people have those dreams for some reason i i just assume that um like they never think about why are the people laughing at them i I think like a lot of the time it's a 
they'll then look down and they're in their underwear or something almost just to rationalize why everyone would just for some reason spontaneously all of a sudden just start laughing at you it's it's kind of bizarre like if you were if you were walking down the street like not in a dream but in your waking life you're walking down the street and all of a sudden everyone on the street like strangers as far as you tell just start looking at you at the same time and laughing yeah you'd be like okay, Ashton Kutcher, come out, you know, I, I get it, I'm being punked, or, like, it, you would find it completely bizarre, but it's amazing the things that can happen in dreams that you just, you don't question it, you just go yeah, with it. So, like, sure. of course they're laughing at me. I just, I, I must be laugh-at-worthy, like, um, I'm a fool or something, like, <laughs> and you just sort of accept their laughter as, like, the, um, I guess, the correct the correct response or something and, and then go, Oh, I must like, and you know, wake up sweating or uh, uh, yeah, whatever happens. But yeah. uh, do people, uh, do many people tell you about um, nightmares as well as dreams? There have been some, which, which people characterized as nightmares. And it's usually up to yeah. the, the experience of the dreamer um, because two people could have the same experience and one of them could go, mm -hmm. uh, you know, could tell me it was interesting because You'd think I would be scared, but I wasn't. I had no negative emotions. I was very almost detached from it, just observing. And then some people would say, mm. for the same situation, I was horrified. I couldn't, I, I was in a panic. I needed to get out of there. Yeah. And that was their experience of it. So it's very subjective. Um, I was going to mention that too, in terms of, uh, I, had, I had a thought and I think I lost it about dreams, dream experience. Damn. Gone. Can't can't think of what it was. What were you just saying? Mm. Before I, I, I've um oh, I can understand that. Yeah, where it can be the same um essentially the same dream or the same a dream of the same experience. And yeah, one person can find it completely mundane or didn't affect them, and the other person can have had like quite an emotional reaction to it. Oh yeah. I, um, I remember what it was. It was oh no, I lost it again. Damn. Oh, it was there. It was there in my head. And then I thought about something else. Dream. I, oh. Ah, it's killing me. It's killing me. It's right there. It, it, especially since I got it back. Oh, yeah. The, the, the feeling of surprise in dreams or lack of surprise mm. more specifically. This is another thing that's re yeah. referenced in the books is that a lot of the things that happen in dreams, we regard as unsurprising and by that i mean like we can be violating the laws of physics yeah. flying dreams it never it occurs to most people who are having a fly if, if it's not a lucid experience if it is that's something else but it's like we accept uncritically anything we see as well this is just happening that's just the way it is we're not asking how did i get in this house with my feet stuck to the floor and a monster coming after me it never crosses our mind we just say okay this is happening now what? Now how do I feel about it? Yeah. Or I'm flying. We, what, how, this is impossible. Why am I flying? I shouldn't be flying. Never occurs to us. Unless it does, and that's its own thing, but usually not. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I was actually about to say, it's funny you say that. I don't know why I haven't even brought up that. Um, yeah, I have lucid dreamed um, before, and it's funny you say the flying thing, because that's usually, like, so I, I completely get what you're saying. Like, um, it's amazing how in dreams, like, something can be, yeah, extremely bizarre, like flying. You, you can't fly when you're awake. So, yep. like, well, while you're in a dream, why do you just accept it as, like, well, of course I can fly. Yeah. Like, that's normal. Um, I'm sort of – I'm a bit of a cluey person, like, um, in general, I guess, in, in or whatever. But um, in my dreams, that's, that, that's how um, my lucid dreams always start is – generally with me flying I'll, I'll i'll be like wait a second this ain't right <laughs> and then i realize oh, i'm in a dream and then i think i've got roughly like it only feels like 30 seconds in the dream to do whatever i want and you think like so many people have said to me like so have you like you know who have you had sex with and i'm i'm like uh no one actually it's really bizarre but all i want to do when i realize i'm lucid yeah. dreaming is fly like i yeah. just fly around if I could choose sex with I wish it. I could actually choose the sex. Yeah, of I course. Would, well, like, but I, I, was, I don't think of it at the time. I was actually going to go the other way. I mean, but, you know, your mileage may vary. There's no right answer. I was just well, thinking actually, yeah. if I could choose sex with any one celebrity, I might 
have a crush on from any time in their life going, you know, go in the last 50 years, hundred years, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. or the, you know, in this, in real life, let's like, if I could, if I could make that happen in real life or I had the power to fly, I'm flying 110%. I will. Sorry, Scarlett Johansson, you missed your chance. I'd rather fly. You know, that's, (laughs) I, I agree. And I only say that I wish I could like at the time think to do the sex thing because, um, why not do both? Yeah. I've, well, I've I've never had a wet dream, and I think it's a bit of the grass is always greener thing. I, I want to yeah. know what that's like, but my dreams are just never sexual, just never. Like I don't know what's whether my brain's too much of a prude or something to like, or whether I just don't find like find that interesting. But to be honest, actually, I'd probably rather fly in a dream than <laughs> dream of having sex because yeah. I can have. Sex in real life. I can't fly in real life. This like, is true. I'm the same with video games. I don't play FIFA because I can buy a soccer ball and go down to the field. I'd rather play a game where I'm, you know, tying up hookers in the Wild West days and chucking them on the rail, <laughs> like train tracks or something. Or Kratos um, or uh, or Master Chief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These things you cannot yeah, exactly. do. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So, well, and we yeah, get pretty much like shooting someone. Uh, I live in Australia. We have quite strict gun laws, uh, including the one I think most of the world has, which is like no shooting people. Um, yeah. One of those things so, where, or, yeah. yeah, or even if, uh, even if it was say justifiable in terms of self-defense and there were no laws against mm. it, yada, yada, that's still going to be a very rare circumstance. I mean, it's very hard to put yourself in a place where oh, yeah. I get to shoot someone today. It generally doesn't happen. And would you? And would you want to? Like, if you look at Rittenhouse, yeah. I'm sure that's, like, I'm sure that kid's going to have, you know, lasting For sure. effects from that. But as much as people want to paint him as, like, a cold-blooded killer and he he wanted to go there to shoot people, that's why he brought a gun and all this sort of stuff, I like, you can say that, but at the end of the day, he's a human being as well. And I don't know what having to, like, defend yourself like that would do to a kid's mind, but, like, yeah. I mean, you can see what it does to adults' minds when they come back from, like, being in war or something. Like, yeah. it's a serious... I, I think sure. it's a much more serious thing to have to live with on your conscience than people give, like... It um, is. It is. ...props to. Like, you know, I mean, um, unless you are legitimately, mm. you know, animal-torturing sociopathic, it does, mm. you know, unless you are literally a serial killer who gets off on it. Yes. It's a very negative experience mm. that most people would rather not go through. And that's a funny dichotomy that let's say a lot of the maybe anti-gun people don't get is like, personally, I am absolutely certain if I had to pull the trigger to save my life, I would, and I would live with that. And I, but mm. I don't want to, and I would rather not have to. It's one of those weird yeah. things of like, I'm not, and they like to make that, oh, you're just bloodthirsty. You want to kill someone. I really don't ever. I hope I never get put in a situation where it's my life or theirs and I have to kill someone mm. to save my own because I think I would and I think I wouldn't like it. And I don't want to live with that either. I don't want to, I don't want to second guess yeah, for the rest of my life. Is there, anything else, is there anything else I could have done? I mean, at the time it didn't feel like it, but yeah. how certain can you ever be about that? And you know, how much would you, would you live the rest of your life wishing I, I had done something different or I, that I could have done anything mm. different? Why didn't that guy just stop running at me with a knife when I pulled my gun? Why, why didn't he stop? Yep. I wish he had stopped that kind of thing. Come here, butters. I, Actually, um, I think, um, go ahead. yeah, oh, I was just going to quickly say, um, I think, uh, like if you, the, the most you could do is like learn to live with it. I, I feel yeah. like it's not something that you could really feel has benefited you, like, yeah. or, or made you stronger. If only, like, the only way you could feel it's made you stronger is if you've actually sort of managed to work through it to the point where you can have some sort of normal life. Like, I, I think that's the only real win you can take from it. Like, yeah, and it's one of those things yeah, that you'll never think was good. It's not good that you no. had to kill. It's good you're still alive. It's good the attempted murderer did not succeed. It's not good that mm. that you had to kill someone uh, to save your own life. It's just like, well, um, unless you think it is good, but I, I don't. That's that. That would be my no, impre- not at all. My impression of it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's how I, I think, think it was I unfair would... the way he was painted as like um, having somewhat wanted it or like yeah. brought it on. I feel. I feel there's a bit of a double standard. A lot of people say, like, you can't ask what she was wearing, when, you know, when she was um, right? raped. But <laughs> you, you can, for some reason, say, like, you know, I, I feel like that, well, why was he there? Like, do you see what he was wearing? He was wearing a gun. Like, yeah. why would you wear such a provocative, like, item of 
apparel if you didn't want to get chased by a, a psycho mob. Like, I don't know what to exactly. say. This kid was, like, afraid for his life, and it, it looked like he had good reason to be. Like, he was being yeah. chased. Yeah. No, and, I mean, I'm definitely one of the one of the people who believes he did nothing wrong at any level, you know, except for... It's, it's, it's a tragedy, but... It's, except for uh, yeah, maybe getting separated, getting separated from the guy he was pal- palling around with, like they should have stayed together. Whose fault that was, I don't know. Maybe that was the only mistake, but you can, you can, anyway. Long I'm sure story. that'll be on the list of things he thinks about that he could have done different, like not yeah. getting separated. Like that will be on the list of things I think that will plague him. Yeah, in, in, in terms of um, what could have or should have been done better, it should not have been necessary for a 17-year-old kid to show up to a riot with a gun because yeah. the, 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 the government, the police should have been taken care of the national guard. There should have been no need for yeah. protecting a business from being destroyed by uh, arson because it was being yeah. effectively protected by the people that are supposed to protect us. So it's, it's one of those situations where like, yeah. I mean, you could yeah. very easily choose to just let your community burn or in that circumstance, he said, no, I'm not going to let this happen. You know, I, I I'm going to do something about well, it personally. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not as though time started when he arrived with the gun. Time started before that when, I don't know, I guess the message on Twitter or whatever it was organised on, the riot, like yeah. that sort of when it started or like I guess well, when all the riots started. C- certainly at that least, was a crazy year. <laughs> yeah, well, it was. Well, certainly at least the, um, the night before, he arrived to defend that location by request. Mm. Um, had the city government, whatever, not told the police to stand down and let the rioters do whatever they want, it, it, there would have would have never been a second night of rioting. They could have cleared the streets and made it a strong deterrent yeah. against a repeat of that behavior. And uh, yeah, it was preventable. Yeah, yeah, I, mm. I think so too. And I think that's that's part of the problem. Of, I mean, I, I. I I, I get where they're coming from when a lot of those folks say, yes, riot is the language of the unheard in some ways. There's mm. it's, it's almost like, what did you think was going to happen? If you're, if you squeeze pe- people too tightly, they're going to act out. I get it. Yeah. I get that. Whether they're, whether we believe they're justified or not, they do. So fair enough. But then there's also, mm. okay, what do you do in those circumstances? Do you fail to stop a riot because you're sympathetic to the reason for it? I'm like, I, I don't think you can. I think both things can be true. You can say, I get you. This feels like something you need to do because you're, you're being hurt. Also, we're not going to let you do that because I'm sorry, we, we don't, mm. we don't burn down our own community to, solve that kind of problem so you have to stop it for the sake of the innocent people that are going to get hurt you know you can't punish them for this other group of people having something bad happen to them whether or not that's true or believing something yeah, bad happened to them. most definitely and and i mean is a riot really like um i mean if it was going to be protest but if you know from the night before that it's riot and not protest then yeah i think it's kind of on the city to be like look we don't want to be out here telling you all to disperse but we're not doing this like come on guys we can't every night burn the city down there's yeah. gonna be nothing left like, well, well and there's also the right yeah. the right way and the wrong way to do it like there's pro- it doesn't there's, solve anything there, either there's pro- like, protest there was like it's a famous um mlk quote that you know a riot being the language of the unheard but yeah. if you're gonna follow his teachings you got to do it right he marched mm-hmm. to selma in a suit and tie holding hands and singing hymns in broad daylight. He had, he, he mm. made a statement with the protest. MLK yep. did not come out in the dark at night wearing a balaclava and throw a Molotov at, at, a, at a car dealership that, that accomplishes nothing. Yeah. That's people that just want to see the world burn. And those are the people that need to be dealt with quote unquote in whatever fashion is least necessary to solve the problem. Um, yeah. yeah, you can't just let it. You can't just let that happen. Just just burn the city down. It's like that's not helping anybody. My opinion, you mm. know, your mileage may vary. I don't get political on this the show very often, but it uh, it, it touches on these well, things. Personally, too. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know we're not. Yeah, well, I mean, I just mean, I, I, there's nothing you've said so far. I think that's um unreasonable uh, in regards to it. Uh, I think yeah, it was it was preventable, and hopefully, it's just uh, like if anything, I just hope they've learned um to sort of nip it in the butt before it turns into a hundred days, uh, days of riot. Like Absolutely. B- being where you are, I'd imagine you 
Yes. Would have had a front seat view, like if, sure you, if you wanted. Like, I I know I was hooked. Like, I mean, it was the best, or well, not the best, but like, I mean, it was amazingly like addictive entertain, like uh, entertainment, oh, not entertainment. Well, some of it was funny, actually, some, but, like, I mean, a lot of it was, like, yeah. sort of horrifying. But yeah. um, no, I, I found these uh, YouTube channels where they would actually grab feeds from all different people on the ground. I watched those. Um, and, yeah, Eyes On, I think, was the channel I watched mostly. But, yeah, they would sort of, um, what's that called when you bring them all together? Like, uh, Aggregate. Coagulate. Yeah, aggr- yeah, yeah. They sort of, like, um, had all the feeds on one screen, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And it was uh, it was insanity. I I I just couldn't take my eyes off it. It was like watching a a year long car crash of yes. people into streets or something. I don't know. Well, no, and you're right about there was a literally about a hundred day siege of the federal building downtown in, in Portland here. And I did. I was almost obsessively watching every single night during that entire summer. And there was one point mm. there was one point at which some of the clashes with police in the um surrounding neighborhoods away from the downtown, you know, kind of heading towards suburbia. Yeah. One of those incidents took place within about two miles of my house. And uh, that night I was very, uh, very attentive and prepared. On edge. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, vague, vaguely. Yeah. It's almost on your doorstep at that point. Yeah. 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 Ready for it to show up on my doorstep and and handle it as, as needed. Uh, You know, and uh, not a, not a fun time. And fortunately it, it kind of, you know, because the police did engage and did their job and broke it up and it it never, Mm. it never reached my doorstep. Um, you know, to to what degree. It seems to fizzle out when it moves into like the further away from the city, it moves. It seems to fizzle out. Like I almost feel like, um, when, uh, Oh, Rittenhouse was being chased like through that, like what looked like suburban, more, a more suburban street or at least not so, you know, middle of town, mm-hmm. um, it did seem like the crowd was, like, even though he's still being chased, it, it didn't feel like it was anywhere near the numbers of people that were at the original scene. Like, it's sort of yeah. like uh, maybe the streets get uh, thinner or longer or people get, like, I don't know, separated or something, but at least it, it like, I think of it kind of like a tsunami, like it sort of, it crashes against the city and the that takes a majority of the like energy out of it. So like the, the water that still like will flow onwards into outer city, into suburbia and stuff is like um, much more like, like less energy. For sure. in it, yeah. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that a lot of folks intent upon riding. Don't drive out into the countryside and do it in an empty field. They, they, they do it in these mm. dense urban downtown centers uh for whatever reason but uh, yeah you don't get too many riots out in the countryside uh i think it's know. probably for attention like uh, yeah. maximum atten- uh, maximum attention i guess yeah. Or exposure yeah um, they went off into you know 50 acres in the woods uh nobody would care yeah yep absolutely yeah but it does make you sort of think because like i don't know about portland specifically but like um most Big cities have CCTV everywhere. I know most people are wearing belt clubbers and stuff, but like facial recognition software and stuff is getting pretty good these days. And I, I believe they actually did. Um, like there was a lot of people that were charged for like things, but I, I'm pretty sure most of the charges were dropped, which I'm sort of fine with. Like I don't think, yeah, any like there wasn't you know like that much uh, like stuff that you could say, all right, go to jail for ten years for or something. But I didn't like the so, like, I'll, I'll be front up. I have no problem with law enforcement as long as they have no problem with me. Yeah. Like, I respect the law. I respect police. But I understand they're just human as well. They have long days. They have bad days. They can slip up. They can abuse their power. I don't hold that against all police, just the ones that um, do do that, I guess. But um, I, I still felt really uneasy about seeing, like, the – well – the fireworks and stuff, I didn't so much bother me, but, like, the really high power green lasers in their eyes, that was, like, I was, like, are you serious? You could, like, blind them, for, like, for life. This isn't, like, corrective laser eye surgery. This is, like, fry your retinas out. Yeah. That's dangerous, sure. man. Like, yeah. I don't know. That's, a, That's tough. Like, it's who's, tough, who's holding that laser? Like, I, what are they thinking? Like, they're just fine with it? Like, uh, 
I have fit, yeah. yeah, that grinded my gears. <laughs> some some of them really get into a mindset where they're like, uh, these are the enemy, and it it's a this battle, is war. It's a battlefield. Yeah. This is war, and sometimes you got to yeah. kill people or blind them. In that case, um, mm. yeah. I mean, I, I feel I, the mob mentality encourages that. Like it, it does it, create a very us sure. versus them mentality. Like if you're not with us, you're against us. Like yeah, kind of yeah. thing. Or even someone who's just like, uh, you know, their their main job is maybe to make sure the guy gets arrested for rape or murder. We, that's not so bad. I think most of us would want them to do that. It's when, and I think a lot of the problem is, is that the the purpose and beneficial function of the police that could and should exist, perhaps, is yep. often obfuscated or, or corrupted by too many bad laws. You, you get the police become the enemy yeah. of people because they're not really helping people as much as they are then on, on the, on the other side of it and persecuting people. And, and you get different opinions on, on this, but I think the uh, drug laws are one way that that goes horribly wrong. It's like, I don't have a problem with mm. you arresting some, arresting a murderer. Please do yeah. L- lock them up. I, I don't want you to hassle uh, some guy smoking a joint. I just don't, I don't care. It's not, it's not hurting yeah, me. Doesn't course, bother yeah. me. So as long as those two things are both forces being used on both things, you know, I think that's not, I think that's not proper or, 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 or good. Uh, and, you know, and I think conductive. Like, yeah. 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 One, one, one definitely to me seems more oppressive and the other one's like more, thank you for helping. You know, that's, that's what we want. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. there's a difference as well. I, I think, um, especially when it comes to drugs and the law, um, it, it's, it, they're all, they all seem to be painted, um, the same like it like something that drives me insane is uh hearing oh weed's a gateway drug like if um if it were a gateway drug then why is it that most people who like you know try a joint or something don't end up on heroin like yeah it's 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 clearly there's a lot of bad arguments in that regard i'm not saying it can't be a gateway to doing harder drugs and stuff like it, it, it definitely can but it's not most of the time so why is that put out there as a like legitimate warning that people should be super afraid of. Like, I mean, it should be um, said that it can lead down a path of, um, you know, looking for a higher high or wh- whatever that may be. Um, but yeah. And, and, and the way it's like, you know, the painted as like, you know, drugs are drugs. Well, no, they're not. There's a very big difference between weed and fentanyl. They yep. are not it's to say like, Oh yeah, I just, I just have a relaxing, um, you know, bit of fentanyl at the end of the day like that's <laughs> right that's a pretty serious drug like you know that that's you have that in like the um micrograms and like yeah you know, a, like a gram of that could kill probably um I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head but it can kill a lot of people that's yeah. it's a very potent drug like I, I think they've had some cases of even you know police or or um whatnot that get a little bit of the dust on their fingertip and it absorbs yeah. absorbs through the skin yep. and, they, and they od on, on just a tiny amount oh, yeah. I, I don't know what the solution is to a lot of that kind of stuff but um um how are you doing for time are you okay to take maybe like a 10 minute break and and then we'll come back and do the dream oh yeah thing? yeah actually I need... benjamin the dream wizard wants to help you pierce the veil of night and shine the light of understanding upon the mystery of dreams Every episode of his Dreamscapes program features real dreamers gifted with rare insight into their nocturnal visions. New Dreamscapes episodes appear every week on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and other video hosting platforms, as well as free audiobooks highlighting the psychological principles which inform our dream experience and much, much more. To join the wizard as a guest, reach out across more than a dozen social media platforms and through the contact page at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, where you will also find the wizard's growing catalog of historical dream literature, available on Amazon, featuring the wisdom and wonder of exploration into the world of dreams over the past 2,000 years. That's Benjamin the Dream Wizard on YouTube and at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. I'm back. You are good timing. I was wondering um, if uh, if you can put aside maybe like just five or ten minutes before you're at time. Can I ask you like I've got um, just some questions like mainly re- related to dreams. Uh, a couple of friends who uh, uh, also had questions for you that um, 
yeah, like the, none of these are like gotcha questions or trick questions or anything like that. They're just, um, well, actually, half of them, to be honest, uh, questions wrapped in a joke. I'm a bit of a class clown, so like <laughs> I, I can't help but um, is this? It's actually kind. It's a. It's kind of a curse and a blessing. Like it's a, a blessing because I can like almost instantly lift the mood. But it's a curse because it's also a defense mechanism. If I feel shit's getting too serious, uh, like yeah. I make a joke, I, sure. I I get I find an out with humor. Yeah. Well, is this something you wanted to do after we're done, or as a part of the stream? Oh uh, no. Well, as a part of the stream, I thought because it's mainly uh, dream related, and um, uh, yeah, they're just like I mean, they're not funny jokes. Like I'm not saying like I, you know, I want to. <laughs> like do some stand up or something they're just um yeah. i'm fine yeah, with, i'm fine with it we can do it now it's, yeah before we jump into the oh, dream yeah? thing, right. we, usually we wrap up uh, right, the cool. show with the, with the dream thing at the end and that lasts as long as it lasts so what, whatever's oh, on your sweet. mind well actually it. it might actually lead right into it at least the way i've written them out they're in sure. no particular order um so one one friend just simply wanted to know have you read um uh carl, uh, carl young's uh so he's got he's asked black book red book uh, gnostic something I can't read my own writing. Um, <laughs> I but yeah he was he, I think he just wanted to know how much of Carl Jung uh, have you are you uh, familiar with pretty much or like you know what have you um, yeah it's been what have you read on him it's been a while since I've read any of the source material I don't think I've read the entirety of those books um, specifically I've heard it's quite dense stuff like it's sort yeah. of it's like really rich chocolate cake, isn't it? It's like takes you got to really chew it, sort of thing. Like it's a, yeah, it's the same with a lot of the philosophers I've absorbed. I've gone to the source material sometimes, but I almost mm -hmm. prefer not synopses. That's that's one way to put it, but commentary. Yeah. I like to read other people's commentary because the way I approach um, the way I approach a lot of these things is not that reading the source material in that manner is bad i think it's actually good and i should probably revisit and, mm -hmm. and and pick up some things that that i haven't read in a, in a while or for the first time but yep. very often what i find myself doing is is when i do read that material i i have thoughts about it and i don't know if they're relevant uh, valid critiques or not while mm -hmm. i'm while i'm reading it and 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 uh so what i prefer to do is go to someone else who has who's referencing that material and giving their understanding of it and their critique of it at the same time so mm -hmm. i so that's that's what i what i've tended to do over the years is go to say critics of someone who 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 isn't yep yeah yeah in more of that, that kind of makes sense like yeah. um you you i do the same thing with a lot of um like i'm just um, I seem to just be endlessly interested in almost everything. Like there's not much I come across in life that I go, Oh, that's boring. Like I'm always, I always find something in it to, that's interesting. And um, yeah, I find I do the same with a lot of things. I'll go to not the source material, but if the, like if the critique or the um, commentary analysis yeah. that I do, the commentary that I do listen to, I find intriguing or I like, I feel like requires more sort of uh, investigation. Then I will go to the source material. Yeah. Um, whether it be like a, um, like a, 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 a paper, like a science experiment in whatever field it is. Like if I feel like if it piques my interest, essentially I'll dig further, but like yeah. I, I find it's time saving if anything, just to get at least like someone else's take on it. Cause if they're just like, well, this guy's a complete crank and you're kind of like, but I've heard that he's actually got some, <laughs> you know, there's some kernels of truth in what he says or something. It may cause me just out of curiosity to go like, well, I don't believe you. I'm actually going to check for myself now. Whereas other times I'll be like, okay, this sounds like a, on the face of it, fair sort of analysis. Like, so mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll either take that as good enough. Like I, I'm not actually interested in digging further or, yeah, yeah, I find I find that across like almost every subject. I, I yeah. try and and I think it's it's a time saving thing, surely. Like it's it's saving you the time of like um <laughs> this is this weird this is sort of weird and it sounds kind of wrong, I guess, but like people have people in their lives for purposes type of thing. And I find I, I have people in my life for certain purposes. So like I've got one mate that's really into Shakespeare. 
I despised Shakespeare like most normal people <laughs> because I had to do it at school and I yeah, hated yeah. it. Like it, the fact that you actually have to, it's almost like learning another language and all the layers of meaning and all this sort of stuff. And oh, I just yeah. found it exhausting and uninteresting as a teenager. So I like paid no attention, but now um, like, like later in life, um, and it's, especially I guess with someone who can explain it well, I've come to appreciate it more. But um, yeah. But yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, I, I uh, just a bookend that as well. So I found it's in my estimation a bit of a life hack to to streamline that process mm -hmm. on a couple of levels. One is that a lot of times, if, let's say if you get someone who's a very balanced commentator, they will say, Here, yep. "Here's the things that seem to make sense and that 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 jive with what other people have said in this in this broad, and here's the things I think are mm -hmm. a little sketchy." That's one way to do it. And then another way is to go with someone who's mm. a pure critic who thinks it's all shit because they won't mention any of the stuff that they can't attack. They will only attack the stuff they think is sketchy. So that's almost yeah. almost also one way of saying, okay, so all of that other stuff you couldn't find a problem with. Fair enough. We, that gives it, it's kind of a va validation by the negative of, oh, well, you left all that out. So you didn't want to talk about it because yeah. uh, you couldn't find a problem with it. But then also you want to take those critiques seriously. And, and to varying different degrees of, of good faith, depending on who, who you're listening to. But, uh, yeah. because that's what I want to know more than anything. I'm like, okay, if all, if this guy said all this stuff, what's the stuff that doesn't, that, that makes the least sense, that seems to make the most assumptions? Where's, where does the logic fall apart? Yeah, and, that's, where, and that's where I get yep. with the philosophers too, is you, um, you want to, you want where to find, are the shock jumps? You want to, yeah. yeah, you want to find the people who were not a fan of their work and, and try to, pick out whether their arguments make sense about the source material and then you got to compare it to this you know in mm. some ways you got to go wait a minute did they even read that right did they quote anything is that <laughs> was that really what that guy said and then you got to dig yeah. dig deeper too but uh that's yeah yeah long story short uh, well I, th I think i've heard you say um i couldn't tell you which episode but in in one of the episodes you uh, um you said you know there's so many different interpretations for just even the um the word water like yeah like there's so much you could pull out of just one word that like yeah it, it does um it does sort of make you think like yeah is their take on this right or is this just what they see and if i look into it i'm gonna actually read something completely different like because if something is like super open for interpretation that that makes me um yeah always curious as to like or would, if, or would I just read it and read the same, like, um, yeah. out of it? Like, uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's interesting. I've only recently sort of gotten into poetry a little bit. I used to think that was super gay, um, <laughs> hated poetry. But um, but now, I've, like, I don't know, I've started to appreciate it. And, yeah, just all the different meanings, words, like the different yeah ways they can be used. It's, it's almost endless. Yeah, and it is a bit outsourcing your... Um brainstorming to to the to the to what is it to the to the wisdom of the crowd in some ways is the way i look yeah. at it it is not possible for me to think all the thoughts on a given subject that could be thought but if you get a dozen people together between mm. all of them probably they're going to cover a pretty good spectrum of all the different ways of looking at something so the more yeah. critical sources and, and, and critical in terms of being of critiquing uh, rather than being critical of um, those yeah. people between them all they're gonna they're gonna generate thoughts that I would never have thought of I, they would read a passage that I'd read and go okay and then they go wait a minute but did you think of it this way I would go I did not that's an interesting take on that line I never thought of mm. it that way so just it's it, this is all all to say it's not like you should avoid the source material and never read it that that's stupid but Mm. more you're you're going to get a better understanding by maybe looking at a bunch of people who've read it before you and let them yep. tell you what they thought then go on to make up your own mind about it and put it into context and uh, things like that now that you've heard that range mm. range of opinion on the subject so that's kind of how i do it yeah 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 and i think uh jordan peterson said uh yeah i don't know if it was one of the rules but like he was he said um you know don't uh, assume someone don't like assume, you know, more than someone. I like, always assume someone knows something uh, you don't know. Like There's something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is where like another opinion is like, I think it can't like ever, like someone else's opinion can never be like truly valueless just because it's from a different perspective. So like it, if you've got blind spots or biases or like just things that you just wouldn't 
see because you of your lived experience or whatever. Like it's just something that you wouldn't never occur to you. Um, yeah, yeah, someone exactly. else's opinion, although possibly ninety nine percent shite, is still never truly valueless. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's cool. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um. Okay, this is a silly question. Uh, like, I think uh, a lot of people give it a good crack. Um, can you do a Jordan Peterson impression? Like, do, can you do a decent Jordan uh, Peterson impression? I, I don't even think I, but, I could but, do a bad one. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say before, before you do, I mean, like one that if he were to say, "See this podcast," wouldn't be like. Oh well, I'm, I'm I'm bloody mad. I'm mad, like, or, or whatever. <laughs> so that's mine. I think he would take offence to that. He'd be like, um, "Yeah, I, I feel like mine's not very good." But uh, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, not a good impression. Question. My wife tells me not to do voices. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, at least if you know, at least she's giving you honest feedback. If that's the case. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, this uh, one is a question that just answers itself. Uh, what is a what is a Freud uh, a Freudian slip? Um, which yeah, you can answer it if you want, but uh, I don't know. I assume people watching your podcast would understand that. Like, I'm saying Freudian instead of Freudian. <laughs> I'm Australian, so I understand the accent could confuse. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's it's a fair question. You know, I got to ask. Okay, I'm coming back around to it, but uh, I got to ask: what was yeah, the difference yeah. between a hypnogogic hallucination and a hypnopompic hallucination, which are both re related to sleep? Um, during an interview uh, a year ago, and I could not pull it out of my head, so I tried. I actually grabbed one of my books off the shelf, and I'm like, "Let me go to the glossary." Most of my books have that kind of oh. Hyp hypnagogic what page is that on so i went to the page and in the footnote i'd added here's mm -hmm. here's what it means um <clears throat> so to, to answer that question now that i've got a uh, uh, hypno uh let's see hypnogogic the root word you know hypnos sleep and gogic mm -hmm. uh, gogos uh, from from the greek i think um yeah. means leading leading to so that hypnogogic is as you're falling asleep hypno pompous yeah. uh, 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 or hyp hypnopompic is related to the word pompous and in, in a way of, of leading away from so as you're exiting sleep. Mm. so there are different kinds of hallucinations we might have as we're falling asleep um, the, the one uh, the, the and the way to keep it straight in your mind is yeah. have you ever had that feeling where you're laying in bed and you're comfy and you feel like you're falling and you jerk suddenly that that feeling like the bed the, the bed just dropped out from underneath you but it's still there and you you, you try to catch yourself catch your balance in a way does, has that ever happened to you yeah yeah that's called yeah. The, that's you really are a wizard aren't you you're, you're <laughs> psychic at least that's, that oh there goes the question you just knocked a question off without me asking <laughs> well, um well that's called a hypnogogic jerk and it almost only happens as you're falling asleep i don't think anyone has ever had that experience as they're awakening from sleep so if you ever get those two mm. confused a hypnogogic jerk uh hypnogogic as you're falling asleep um yeah, mm. yeah and uh, like so well my question is yeah, we're gonna essentially come back, we're gonna come in, back in, around to it yeah for sure um yeah with uh the hypno Goggy, uh, uh, yeah, with the specifically with feeling like like so, it's almost like I'm lying on the very edge of like a multi-story building, and I roll off it, wake up, and I wonder. So, like as far as I know, the different like uh, sleep, st uh, brainwave states, like when asleep, like um, it's it's REM sleep or REM sleep. That's um when you do the most vivid dreaming, isn't it? But you can. You do still dream in the other brain states, don't you? Like, yes, surely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's, and this goes because I was wondering. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just going to say because I was wondering. Uh, uh, like, I'm just going off my like. I learned all this stuff like a long time ago. I haven't looked into it recently, so yeah, I'm just yeah. going off memory here. But um, I thought it was like something like 90 minutes or something into sleep, you go into like um, the the REM sleep. But at the very start, it's like. Uh, you know, restful wakefulness, well, alpha wave sort of there. How is it, like, I, I sort of wonder to myself, do I just, like, invent the side of the building? Is that like a sort of, like, post hoc, like, just invent, you know, conjure, conjuring in my um, brain of I was on the top of the building rolling off? Like, or is it, 
like actually I'm dreaming that that's happening. So I feel a lot like I just sort of justify it like that after I've jerked awake. I've sort of gone like, why would I jerk away? Because I thought like I had the feeling of rolling off something, and I'm yeah. I'm just filling in the blanks and going, well, it must have been somewhere high. There, there is a real problem there. And speaking speaking of Freud, I think he was one of the first to propose the problem of what he called secondary elaboration, which is where we kind of reflect on the dream and even immediately after the dream, and we start adding things that aren't there or making sense mm. of things in a way that filling in gaps, filling in and gaps. stuff, coloring coloring things a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's always the and the problem of secondary elaboration seems to get worse the longer from the dream we are reflecting back on it. So our yeah. understanding or experience of a dream, what we think we saw could be radically different the morning after or 10 years later um, and, and, yeah. and less accurate 10 years later, which is actually just kind of our problem with memory in the first place is the further we are away from something, the, and, and this, this is another interesting thing about memory is that it seems as if, or the, the, the current theory and there's evidence for it is that what, mm. if I, remember a past event today what i'm remembering is the last time i thought of it which might have been last week or last mm. month and i'm mm. not remembering the event itself and so what we do is we, we make this kind of daisy chain of the event the first time we remember it and we remember that first time the second time what we're remembering is the first time we remembered it and it just goes and that's why memories yeah. get more and more distorted the further from because we're and you get that you get that uh, mm. kind of internal game of telephone going on where you're telling yourself a story over and over again and the story might change the further from the event um definitely yeah I, I think that varies from person to person as well i i suspect that people who have um a lot more um like they're a lot more loose with how willing they are to i guess play with or color their memories or, or, or whatever or, or how far from their memory they feel like they can essentially elaborate or add to they don't feel like they're talking shit or making it up or whatever but like yeah. um i feel like that would change person to person because some people i've noticed like because like once you're around someone for long enough you start to hear them say the same stuff yeah and i've noticed <laughs> with some people they're actually quite accurate because they only ever really repeat the things they said in the first place they're not adding much to it or it's only slightly changing or being exaggerated a little bit or um whatever but yeah very interesting about the way uh that yeah when you like first experience the dream that's like the the first painting of the canvas and then like yeah when you remember it like when you've um like just woken up or whatever that's like you've sort of like gone okay and told someone say that's your first time you've painted over it but like it's still like pretty close to what it was but yeah as time goes on it does seem as though like um if you don't repeat the like it seems as though just like me uh, thoughts or memories that are um repeated like it's the whole like uh, i guess repetition learning thing but like the more it's repeated the more it seems to get burnt into your memory um and yeah you've got to try i guess your best to not let it get too colored because i do realize like i see it in my my own self like i i know there's there's like um memories that i have almost photoshopped to the point of like not even resembling what yeah. happened like <laughs> makes, and, makes but, a better but story. I, can, I can recognize it yeah it yeah. does though it does <laughs> and like um and that can't happen and yeah. sometimes i will flavor it a bit but like generally afterwards you know be like and, you know, and that's exactly how it happened, except for, you know, that part where I said that I, I flipped a car and it landed it on the wheels or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, just flavor <laughs> it up a bit. And, um, and I didn't want to lose the uh, the original question. What like what is oh, yeah, a Freudian the, slip? Um, and yeah. Freud was one of the first persons to document the phenomenon and give it give it a name. And I don't think he called it a Freudian slip. I think he called it something else. But that's all I can remember at the moment. Um, mm, that'd it, be quite the ego. Oh, right to, to name it after himself i don't think he named anything after himself mm. i think that's what we call it now and that's uh, i don't remember what he called it he, he called it something else um yeah. but the the basic idea is that we I, and it's usually better to to give give an example and i was racking my brain to try and come up with one but it's like where we say a, a different word than we intended to speak but that that different word is more revealing of how we really feel is ba the basic concept. Um, mm. 
Mm. So, uh, and very often it's a word that sounds similar to what we composed in our head for that word in the sentence. And that's why I can't think of a very good answer uh, or a, a example. What a, um, well, I was just um, back in my reign and like, no, I'm joking, but like, you know, like spoonerisms, like I feel like they're almost in the same class of like things as a floating slip. Cause like I've noticed, well, I mean, not in the same class, but like they get, they can be mistaken as each other quite easily. It's like, so sometimes like um, if I want to say uh, goodbye and see ya at the same time, it'll like blend into the one word because my brain tries to say both at the same time yeah, yeah, and it yeah. blends, but it, it like just flukishly sometimes it will actually blend to like almost sound like another word, another like unique word, a real word, sorry, that um, somehow you could still find a, like it could still make sense type thing. Like, so I, I'm trying to say two things at once. It, it blends together. I'm um, failing to think of a good example of that at the moment. I've got a feeling like the word, uh, like it's something rhymes fuck and something else is a common one that I that I do. But I, I make those, yeah, brain farts all the time. Yeah. And and the Freudian slip, um, I've, I'm not, yeah, I don't make many Freudian slips, but I do claim a lot of, um yeah, like failures it's like to talk properly uh, as <laughs> yeah. Freudian slips if I do like just mess something up. Yeah, and, and uh, an example came to my mind, be but it's not a good one. It's just all I can think of. It's as if uh, someone says, uh, hey, um, wow, what am I trying to say? What's the setup for it? Um, hey, what are you doing on Friday? Can you come over to the barbecue? And your response is, no, I'm sorry. I have to go to jerk. I'm sorry, I have to go to work. And what you were thinking was, I work for a jerk that's making me come in and so I can't come to your party on Saturdays. Making my this my jerk of a boss is making me work, but those yeah, you know, I'm sorry I have to go at my job. Like it could yeah, even yeah, be yeah. like work and job, like trying to like your brain just at the last moment, sort of like it's it's like you can't make up your mind which is the better word, and so you literally just try and say them both, and you mix them together. It's yeah. such a weird. Well, no, no, that that thing. is, I would say that is actually a separate phenomenon. That's more along the that spoonerism side you were talking. So a Freudian slip is yeah, actually different. Yeah. Where what you were thinking is my boss is a jerk. So when you went to say the word work, the word jerk came out instead because that's because you were thinking of the person and oh, and how much of a jerk yeah. how much of a jerk they are to make you come in on the weekend when yeah. you were supposed to have the day free to, to be able to go hang out with your friends. So it's more along those lines of it's, it's that revelatory, like a, a, an accidental word substitution that reveals a more genuine feeling is, is kind of a Freudian slip tight of it. It's not what you meant to say, but it's actually the truth is kind of a thing. And then mm. that gets weaponized against some people. Cause if you stumble over words and you'd make a spoonerism, they'll go, Oh, is that, are you really feeling like not what I meant at all? Not how I actually feel. Uh, Freud was, a yeah. little, Freud was a yeah. little, um, he was a little more on the patients are liars side of the equation. And by that, I mean, people don't honestly self report as much as might be beneficial to them in the therapeutic process. So he felt you had to dig a little more. You had to confront a little more. You had to assume the person was not telling yeah. you everything. And he and he he very much conceptualized that in his his theories of defense mechanisms. He's like everyone's putting up these walls mm. to keep the world out and to protect themselves. He wasn't wrong about that, but where it exists and how it manifests and whether it's you know and um it's very rare for me in dream analyses to say uh, you know so certainly in this format with 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 um a uh, uh, guest and it's being recorded for the entertainment value and what I try to give people mm. a good experience. But one thing I also try not to do is say, I think you're not telling me something you should. I think you're hiding something from me. I think I need to confront you because what I'm seeing is pointing me in one direction and you're telling me not to go there. I think you don't want to go there, but we should. And that's kind of more what Freud mm. was getting. And I don't do that in these because that is something that I think you can only do after you've built a trusting therapeutic relationship, after you get to know the person mm -hmm. a little bit better, I might have an intuition that that's likely like I've done a few private dream interpretations and I've gently pushed a little bit saying, I think there's something more here. And I was told, no, there isn't. 
I don't want to talk about that. And the, the person gave me a lot of cues that were like, let's focus on something else and avoid that issue. And I'm like, okay, you know, you're, you're the client in terms of, you know, all I could do is kind of gently mm-hmm. suggest, I think we should look at this a little bit more. And, you know, because it was, again, because it was a one-off, even though it was private, even though no one was mm. ever going to see it, even though, uh, maybe I didn't know him well enough to, to even suggest that technically yeah. I, I, my, my intuition was saying, I think there's something here that you could benefit from having a look at, but if you don't want to, mm. I'm not here to ruin your day. I'm, I can't even say for sure. I know there's something there that we need to have. I need to confront you on that and get over your denial or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's, it's, it, a lot of it has to do with, uh, the proper arrangement and circumstances to really be able to tell the difference about what's going on. Yeah. And, and Freud may have gotten to know his, his patients well enough to say when he hears a particular Freudian slip, he'd say, aha, this is a pattern I've seen about other stuff. Now the person seems they're, 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 it's almost like a cry for help in that regard of like, we haven't addressed something that I know has been waiting for us to get around to. So let me use this opportunity of a slip, a slip of the tongue to open mm-hmm. the door to that door to that and say, as the doctor, as the authority, oh, yeah. as the authority, I know this is something that is what you really feel. Tell me more about that. Mm. We need to confront this now and have this out. And, and that's, I think a lot of uh, Freudian psychoanalysts still use that methodology today. I, I think there's, there's people who are pretty much a hundred okay. years later, still carrying on his legacy and doing things pretty much the same way he did in, in a lot of regards. Seems so, a bit, um, it does seem a bit, uh, not forceful, but it does seem a lot um, more forceful than what I would think, um, would be, most people's comfort level but i've um yeah, yeah i just I, th- I think i'm a bit touched in the head or something like i just don't um it's not like i don't have a filter but i don't um have like any well like yeah any problem telling anyone like literally anyone like a complete stranger on the street like anyone on the planet anything about me gotcha yeah. which i know sounds like a lie because that <laughs> sounds ridiculous like Everyone has stuff that they won't tell people. Actually, wait, yeah, no, sorry, I do too, of course. Like, yeah. you know, of course there's stuff that, like, I would never tell a, a, a living soul, like, let alone a, a therapist that I would, like, had a, you know, ongoing, like, um, relationship with or something. Um, but of the majority of my life, like, yeah, I, I'm a complete open book. Like, so, yeah, if if there is anything that I say personally that you think I'm – maybe not going deep enough on or something yeah f- feel free to um sure. like to say it because like i won't take offense like you like we were talking about before with um critiquing as opposed to being critical um yeah i find like uh i find stuff like getting corrected on my spelling i, I don't find i don't take that personally i don't take that as a as someone being critical of me i take that as a critique like a honest like hey you're you spelled that wrong so if I don't know, like if I don't get corrected, I'm never going to know I'm spelling something wrong. <laughs> like, yeah, um, yeah, sure. but yeah, I'm yeah. an open book pretty much. Well, and there's, and when people say things like that, they're not lying. And and I think you, you caught the caveat, which is also true for most people. It's like, there are people who are an open book except for that page. And that's still an open book mm. in broadly speaking. And then there's people who are like, you can look at the cover you're not looking at any of this book yeah. and that's very, you can read the blurb you, maybe Yeah, you, you, yeah. Can, look at, you yeah. can look at the blurb on the back. That's it. That's all you get to know about me yeah. until I invite you in. And then I'll let you look at certain chapters. And, and that's, um, mm. it's kind of a, a broad strokes way of looking I think that's at more it. normal. Maybe so. And I think both are normal in their own way. I'd say most yeah. people fall somewhere in between. Um, so mm. there, there are those who are very closed off and those are people who are very open and everyone else is in the middle. And I don't think it's, um, you know, as you said, touched in the head at all to be, I'm, I'm pretty much an open book like that too. There's, there are some things I won't talk about relatively few. Um, I think I'm significantly mm. more open and, and freewheeling in terms of whatever's on my head. I'll just say it, um, than most people. So, so to have that be, um, you know, to kind of validate your experience and say, that's not broadly speaking, abnormal at all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah not oh, all. That's, that's um, reassuring. Don't worry. You're fine. <laughs> oh, sweet thank god right that's most that's, i was worried there. That's, that's actually a lot of what say therapists do is because a lot of people have 
uh, what, what am I trying to say? Mis <clears throat> misunderstandings of what is or is not normal. And a lot of times mm. the therapist's job, not their job, like their only purpose, but a lot of what they do is to say, oh yeah, okay, a lot of that happens to a lot of people. No worries. Uh, um, you're, you're not, mm. you're not crazy is, is, is the line. Uh, you know, that, yeah. that thing, yeah. that thing you thought made you, you wackadoo was, is perfectly, perfectly normal. And a lot of people have that. And, mm. you know, it doesn't have to destroy your life. We, we hold us all this to a lot of standards and it gets worse with say, social media and these days I, I worry about kids because what we're seeing is carefully curated best parts versions of people's life when they the the, mm. the sixth take when they had the camera angle and the lighting just right and they made all the yep. all the all the correct cute expressions not the other five and not the three they did after that because they weren't sure it was good enough but that one version gets put out there and someone looks at that and goes i'm not good enough because i can't do that well you probably mm. could if you had multiple takes to if you put the time and effort into presenting yourself just in that one particular way from that one particular angle oh yeah 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 so the, the, i don't have to pay i wouldn't have the patience for that no, uh, no, you, you gotta sort of take me as i am that's what and especially that's why i'm much prefer um like verbal like discussion rather than in writing because like a really slow typer but <laughs> um but b like i like to just sort of like yeah free flow sort of talk and if i you know, stumble on a word or i uh, mess something up or i say something like like just say with um the what is a freudian slip if you took that to heart because you're a you know you're the um you know the the sigmund freud uh freud fucking hell <laughs> that actually was a wait, wait was that a yeah that was a freudian slip because i said it fucking again but anyway just say you took it to heart and you're like oh um that's a a joke about a, like a you know, making a Freudian slip, but the connotations like negative towards Freud or something. Yeah. Um, People get touchy about stuff sometimes. That's yeah. Yeah. And like, you can't always control the way someone will take things. The best you can do is just try and get your message across the best you can. Like it, it's a, it's a strange thing. Like it always takes two to tango and it's a, like when you're talking to someone, it's, it's a two way street. Like, you know, it's, it's much your job to understand the person you're talking to as it is to be understandable. Like it's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. We can even talk to each other, to be honest. I do find it like crazy. Just the depth at which like humans can communicate with each other about just insane shit. Like, and like, I assume understand each other. Like, I don't know whether <laughs> I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm assuming too much, but like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of people, um, yeah, on the same wavelength or Yeah. Well, that reminded me of a, I think it was a Joe Rogan joke. He said, you know, we're just psychic monkeys who make mouth sounds and our thoughts appear in, in, in the other person's head. Like, yeah, mm. that's kind of, that's a great way to look at it. Uh, and, and, and broadly, again, we're doing my Jordan, this is my Jordan Peter Peterson impression, broadly speaking. So, uh, I keep saying that a lot, <laughs> but there's like, there's about four and there's different models of communication, the communication process. What is it? How does it work? But I like mm. the one where there's four parts to it. There's what's in my head, how I conceive of it. There's the words I choose to try and communicate it. There's mm -hmm. how well you hear the words I'm saying and the tone I say them in and how you interpret all that stuff. And then there's, there's yep. your understanding of the message itself. And though anywhere along those four parts, the entire communication process breaks down and no mm -hmm. actual communication occurs wrong concept wrong words wrong hearing wrong understanding in the other person so mm. that's that's a tough part when it and that's why it's such a big deal to say have good faith debate or discussions cuz it's very yeah. easy to for the the person you're trying to communicate with to yeah. break down the communication on their end by say by understanding it wrong intentionally or accidentally by hearing it wrong mm. not really listening well and by critiquing well you use the wrong words so i'm going to hold you to account for yeah phrasing it poorly in a way that if i gave you a little charity i'd say okay i get where you're coming from let me let me try it this way if you what if you said it like this is that what you mean and so there's a lot of that feedback stuff going on yeah um yeah. So there's a, a lot of it comes down to how generous the listener wants yeah. to be in understanding it because like it can be sort of almost like 
you know, incorrectly assumed that it's the communicator's, uh, like, it's the talker's um, fault because, like, well, why does the other person understand what you couldn't say it, like, in a good enough way? So it's almost like the power is held by the person understanding, which is, like, yeah. I think when it comes to good faith, you've got to always look at the listener's um, response That's because like, that's where they've got the power. They're the one that cho- chooses whether they take it in good or bad faith. Um, for sure. Ultimately, um, which I think is why I um, I don't like. I'm pretty sure most um, things people say to me to insult me go straight over my head. Because like, because I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's not just that I don't care. It's yeah, just yeah. that I don't um, like understand the. It's a joke or something. Like it's um yeah. Sometimes I've got to ask people. Wait, are you insulting me at the moment? And they're like. No, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, uh, sorry. I thought what you said was maybe meant to insult me or something. I just didn't understand. And then they'll like explain it a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just a, having a slow day. Yeah. Um, well, well, and for me, saying you know, don't give a fuck is more like it's not like it isn't. For me, it's not the insult so much as the intent. Like someone could say the exact same thing, and and they're joking not meaning to be hurtful or maybe they're even you know <laughs> what they say you know taking the piss of, of like uh uh hey you're, you're being here's a you know here's a gentle uh, oh like a gentle here's really a gentle, gentle poke like, at I, something you do that's kind of stupid and you know play yeah, yeah in that regard and then like, there's people that are just malicious and they're not they they mm, you know and there's there's a bunch of ways that can go wrong too they're trying of, they're almost going to get like yeah. a boner from ruining your day sort of thing yeah yeah their purpose is not yeah. say you you made the uh spelling error thing their pur- purpose is not to say oh look at that you're uh you switch those letters uh you might want to fix that yeah. their purpose is to say well look at the fucking moron that can't spell yeah. what's, what's wrong with you yeah. like yeah uh, I'm not interested in your feedback. Thank you very much. So at that point, it's like, don't care. Mm. You know, if it's, a, yeah. if it's a, this constructive you know, criticism, then yeah. it's just criticism very, for the sake different. of it. <laughs> like, yeah. So that's where I come from. Um, on that. Did you have more uh, questions written out? More, more friends that had, uh, oh yeah, that's just go for it. Uh, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one friend wants to know, uh, so you're in, fa- uh, you're in favor of the, NAP or non-aggression principle, oh, or do yes, you endorse absolutely. it? Absolutely. And yeah. is that so? The question is: um, Is that because you're a dream wizard and it spells nap? Is that the real reason? <laughs> I should. Uh, I should have thought. Or is that, that just a, an amazing coincidence? That is what Carl Jung would call a synchronicity. Yes, it is. I, I had never considered. Ah. I should have thought of that myself. I, I believe in the NAP because I'm a dream wizard and it spells nap. That's fantastic. Uh, well, that's no, that's the origin story. That's kind of the culmination. <laughs> that's the culmination of uh, 30 some odd years of thinking about moral systems and what's the best way. Um, what are the proper limits on human interaction? And so for me, yep. it is, uh, yep. yeah, it's uh, uh, the non aggression principle says that initiating aggression, being force, fraud, or coercion against other people is inherently bad or wrong. Uh, that I should not uh, twist someone's arm to get them to do what I want, no matter what I want them to do. Um, other people have different <clears throat> different standards, but it's a, yeah, it comes down to like um, you know I might want something from you, or I might want you to do something I believe is beneficial for your sake. But at that point, that's where that's where my authority ends is in that desire. I can communicate it. I can advocate. Mm -hmm. I can use my words to say, would you please give me that? I'll make you a fair trade voluntary, or I can, um, advocate. I think you should, I think you should should quit smoking or go for a walk because it would be good for your health. That's as far as it goes. No force, no coercion, no, you know, no threats. Uh, and yeah. that's, you're that's, not going to start hiding their cigarettes or like, you know, no. shaming them if they're outside having a cigarette or something like that. Maybe, yeah. maybe shame. Yeah. I don't know. That's the thing. A li- just a little bit of shame. A little bit. I, I think we need to bring more shame back shame into is not, society. Shame I is think... not force. That's, uh, yeah. I don't like that. I don't want to yeah, be around yeah. you when you do that. If you're going to do that, I'm not going to be around you. That's ostracism. It's like, if you value my time and energy and friendship like your uh your wife says yeah. your mouth tastes like an ashtray i don't want to kiss you would you please fucking quit smoking and you're like 
I mm. would really like to kiss my wife. Maybe I should quit smoking. So she wants to kiss me. That is, you know, some yeah. people would view that as coercion, but she's just, I, I look at that like that's her limit. She has something she doesn't like. Yeah. She's saying, look, I'm not going to use force on you. I'm not going to threaten to use force to get you to do what I want you to do. But this is mm-hmm. my limit. I don't want to kiss your mouth when it tastes like that. Yeah. So I'm just, and that's I'm not, fair. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and some people have a hard time parsing out that idea of what is and isn't coercion. Coercion in my estimation, mm. the, the definition I use is it is the threat of force. It's when the mafia comes in and says, it'd be a shame if someone burned down your business. So maybe you should pay us for protection. That's coercion because yeah. the threat is implied. You don't do this. You're going to, you're, we're going to burn your business down. It's in the, it's, it's in the, uh, the offer you can't refuse. Um, but, yeah. but saying these are my yeah. boundaries. This is something I will not do. That is always acceptable. This, this far and no further. Um, thank you. No, mm. uh, I will not voluntarily do that thing under these circumstances that it, to my estimation is not actual coercion. So there you yeah. have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, good answer. Thank you um, very much. okay. Mm-hmm. Next one is, is it true? I think you mentioned earlier something about, um, personal sort of theories that people have that um, can sometimes be a bit wacky or like um, turn out to be true or not true, whatever the case. Um, sort of uh, I got a little pang of like panic inside me when you said that because I worried that so me eating blue cheese before I go to bed probably doesn't actually affect my dreams. Is that is that what's more likely in your opinion or? Well, <clears throat> It is a bit of an. Open... I can't even find much of a correlation, but I it, have it... had some crazy dreams after blue cheese. Yeah, and actually, it that might be a factor for you. It's not like it's impossible. So the old theory used to be, uh, you remember when they in medieval times they would say the humors of the blood, sanguine, phlegmatic, bilious, mm. those they had the different four, colored the four liquids, hum- yeah. the four humors model, and they didn't really understand biology back then i mean they could see what happened if it cut someone open his guts and spill out but they didn't really know how it worked so so they had this four humors model and what they thought was if you eat yeah cheese specifically um and this may not have been again i'm gonna hedge hedge around all this too i'm gonna try and give you my best understanding it isn't like they were necessarily way off base or what they were suggesting was impossible they just chalked it up Mm -hmm. to that entirely which wasn't a good explanation so um yeah. that's, that's where i'm going with this so it we we do know very very certainly that your physiological state can affect your dreams but that's much broader than people think so what we found or, or, or what they what came to be accepted understanding uh, 100 150 years ago was would they let go of that that model that old uh, humors model and yeah. they, they started looking at things like well if you have a dream and, and they actually knew this way, way back 2000 years ago to some degree. But mm. if you have a dream, uh, the classic dream is you dream that you are uh, driving a carriage and you are the, you know, you're the guy with the whip riding and the horses and the horses are sweating and panting and struggling to get up this hill. That was a sign that maybe the person had something wrong with their heart. And if they would go to mm. get their heart analyzed by a by a doctor medical doctor they would find yeah you have a heart condition and it was indicated by the dream so physiological another dream this guy had was um he documented his own dreams and what he had a dream was a giant buzzing lobster-like insect huge that Mm. landed landed on him and attacked his hand and he woke up and there was a mosquito bite on his hand where that giant lot. So this, <laughs> this tiny mosquito yeah. bite, this irritation in, yeah. got into his dream and the buzzing of the mosquito and the, and the feeling of the welt growing and the itchiness translated mm. itself into this imagery of a giant and, and uh, a creature of outsized uh, proportion to the actual mosquito and the bite itself and the damage uh, that, you know, that was done in the dream compared to just an itchy lump. Um, okay. Mm. Long story short on that. So we're getting, getting back around to um, dreams. We do know that different medications can cause people to stop dreaming or start dreaming when they didn't, or in that, in that sense. Um, and this goes back to the REM REM question too. I wanted to uh, uh, address that as well. I forgot, forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there are some people who say, I used to never remember my dreams. <clears throat> then I started taking this medication and now I have the most vivid dreams. And there's a long history throughout the literature mm -hmm. as well of people who have extremely vivid and sometimes terrifying nightmares because they've been drinking alcohol because they were using smoking opium. There's a very uh, mm. famous case of a, a guy, um, De Quincey, something De Quincey. He wrote Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And one thing he detailed in that book was all of the... <laughs> uh strange and horrifying dreams he felt trapped in that felt like they went Oof. on for, forever yeah yeah so there's yeah. definitely adding chemicals and okay so what's the difference between food and drugs well um drugs are defined as any substance which alters the structure or function of the living organism comma except food because food also alters the structure uh. or function of the living organism that's why cheese is not a drug but caffeine is in, in a coffee, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Yeah. You can live without caffeine and coffee. Cheese is just, what is it? It's, 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 you know, we have, um, different, different types of, you know, fats and proteins and that kind of thing. Sugars. Yeah. Um, well, I was sort of more curious as to, is it like maybe something in the mold, like the, the blue, the whatever, um, strain of mold that is that grows yeah. in the blue cheese. Cause I mean, molds the same, well, I mean, mushrooms are, like molten mushrooms with both fungi. So I was thinking, like, could that maybe be it? Because, like, I'm allergic to penicillin, which is also mold. Like, is it, like... Yeah. And this may, and this um, may a be... a strange kingdom. And, and this is always... I mean, the answer is it depends, and usually it depends on the individual and, and the specific circumstances. There's a lot of factors that have to come together. So long story short on mm. the... I say that, and it's never a long story short, uh, or never short... Um, it may be that you, based on your physiology and taking into account the idea that, well, you have a sensitivity or allergy to penicillin and you, when you specifically eat blue cheese in a certain quantity at a certain time of night before falling asleep, you will have mm. more likelihood to experience a certain type of dream. That may be a very mm. strange, unique circumstance to you that is not so bizarre, broadly speaking, but definitely the blue cheese because it's you. And because it's related to this other, you know, sensitivity. So someone else who ate a different kind of cheese or uh, what did they say? There was someone who reported once that if they wanted to have, there was a, there was the author of kind of Gothic horror back in the late or mid 1800s. And they reported okay. that they saw a lot of their Gothic horror novel content in their nightmares and that they induced those nightmares on purpose eating almonds or walnuts that they found on the nights when they ate those nuts so they may have had a mild nut allergy oh, wow. that caused them yeah. then to to have associated nightmares due to and people like um if you have gastric upset <clears throat> go to bed with a with a with an upset stomach or one develops because let's say i'm sensitive yeah. to red tomato sauce if i have red tomato sauce too soon before i go to bed i get a lot of stomach acid and then my sleep will be disrupted yeah. by physical internal sensations of discomfort that may not wake mm. me up but they might creep into my dreams and make me have um a nightmare that i was being disemboweled and i've watched it all fall on the floor in front of me specifically mm. because I'm having oh, an upset stomach that if I was awake, I would go, where's the antacid? Oh. <laughs> so all of these things yeah. are very, very valid contributors. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. You give me a perfect justification why I can keep uh, feeding my addiction to blue cheese. Right. <laughs> why would you um, not? Oh, I also wanted to address that. You, you, yeah, true. You'd ask the idea, uh, the question about, um, when do we sleep? And it, I think I was heading there and we got, we got, we got off track. There's so many tangents. Mm. Um, but oh, it's been so, great. so it used to be, well, you know, I've enjoyed it too. That's no, no, no. And if I never mm. thought of it, we never talked about it. So be it. But since I did, I want to, I want to tell you, we used to be fairly certain that dreams only happen during rapid eye movement, REM sleep. And mm. that was based on some, data and it's almost like well we observed a thing and it seems to be a consistent thing therefore we think that's the entire thing and it, it isn't that they weren't wrong about anything up to that moment they said and that's the entire thing if they'd left that part out like we only dream during REM sleep their conclusion mm. or their their data otherwise was was perfectly fine what they did was oh we noticed people's eyes tend to move when they're asleep. What's happening? So we'll wake them up and we'll ask them, what were you experiencing? And they'll go, I was dreaming. Mm. And then the conclusion they drew was, oh, 
moving eyes means you're dreaming and that only happens so for for a certain amount of time after you've been asleep for a certain amount of time so it's a very contained yep. experience and they used to think that was that's the entire circumstance under which dreams happen well <clears throat> what they yeah. did was other experiments then saying let's wake people up at random times and ask them what was happening and uh. no matter when you wake someone up and ask them what were you experiencing they will say i was dreaming so it, it appears mm. dreams happen the entire night from the moment we are fully unconscious to right about when we're waking up and coming out of it and even kind of there's a uh, what's been called a the kind of twilight space. Uh, there was a word yeah. for it. I can't remember where we're not quite asleep and not quite awake. We, we we're, yep. we're getting an awareness that we're in bed and, and where we are, but we're still in the tail end of a kind of dream experience. We're still having images or thoughts about. And, and what mm. I what I think is that the um, it's almost as if that river stream of consciousness just goes underground for a while. And then that when we're awake, it pops back up above ground, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah, that's actually yeah, that's a really good. Yeah, way but it never of, really um, stops. Or I, I, it, as far as I know, the uh, the 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 lungs breathe, the brain, uh, the heart beats, and the brain thinks, and it doesn't stop ever until we are dead. It just it's a constant. Or in a vegetative uh, coma or something. And even, even and even um, then, you know. Uh, actually, yeah, people still re will report. Having like some wake up from comas, yeah. having dream experiences. Sure, I was in another place and I was there forever, and it was, yeah. it was amazing or it was terrifying. But um, also, there's there's the circumstance where the body's alive and we can keep yeah. it alive with intravenous feeding. It'll keep doing all its autonomic stuff. You know, we can put it on a lung machine mm. and breathe for it. But they do the the EKG stuff for on on the or that's not it's. EKG is for the stomach. It's uh, EC ECG. Yeah, ECG for the brain. Uh, e sorry, e e ECG. E e Encephalocardiograph. No, it's uh, See, that's, e That was for the this e e G. Encephalo Encephalo electro Encephalogram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. Uh, encephalo uh, is like uh, hydrocephaly, water in the brain. It's mm. cephalic. Mm. Uh, anyway, long story short, you're right. You get your medical terms right. Um, mm. it, it shows no results. Like the brain scan is like no activity. And so I don't know what's going yeah. on in that. You know, it's certainly not firing like it is when we're awake or asleep. That's it's some third state, which is I mean, that's why they call a brain dead. It's like it's dead because we mm. can't we can't see it move. It's not doing anything um, at that point. You might as well kind of just turn off the pump and let them go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I've we've, um, I've actually got a family friend who's uh, been in a coma for like, I think, a decade now or something. Wow. But like. Brain dead essentially, but they his get no... parents just couldn't make the choice that, like, at the time they just couldn't bring themselves to turn off the machine. Yeah, and then yeah, you know, when they finally did, his body had sort of like regained enough sort of like control to like half breathe, half sort of survive, and they saw that as a sign that he was like, you know, fighting and he was going to make a comeback or something. Like, yeah, he didn't get any better than that. He's not mm. ever going to get any better than that. I think. And but, that's that's really yeah, hard a bit for tough say, choice. Yeah, tough a choice, parent yeah. to give up hope for their kids. You know, what if he is? Mm. Because there have been stories of people that you know, yeah, we're in a coma for ten years and they woke up. Now it's rare. Yeah, exactly, it's rare but not impossible. <sighs> and you hold out hope like that to someone who you know loves their kids so much, and it's you know, oh, totally, it's, it's hard to argue. It's almost bankrupted them as well, which is even uh, like makes it even sort of more heartbreaking. But. Yeah, yes, I mean, yeah. they've made the decision and that's what they wanted. So it's, um, and yeah. if, you, if you ask them, they, you know, even if they, you know, turn, turn it off and he dies, eventually they would probably go, we, we regret nothing. We, we had to try at least that hard to be. Oh, like, yeah. No, nah, his mom doesn't go. regret a thing. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. like fine with it. Yeah. For sure. Um, so. I think I more stuff. Um, only had one more question. That was, um, yeah, what do you think the deal is with, uh, why certain dreams seem uh important or like there's a meaning behind them whereas other dreams can be like so like um, i i think the majority of my dreams are i reckon super mundane they're still like fun in a way like i don't mean fun as in like i'm smiling laughing and running around or something i just mean like i'm finding it interesting or it's it's novel or something wherever i am even if i'm just standing on a wall like next to like a couple of other dudes and we're guarding this like gate or something like 
and it's like almost just nothing going on. It's not exciting. If it was a movie, you'd turn it off. You'd be like, boring. Like, what else is on? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I'll wake up and I'll just be like, wow, what a strangely like mundane dream. Like, why can I even still remember this like five minutes after waking? Like, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing to be learnt from this. Like, I, I, I literally can find just zero meaning behind some of my dreams. It's, yeah. But it's still cool that, 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 that you can have them. Like, it's, um, I sure. guess you don't have to, like, they don't always have to be productive to still be enjoyed, I guess. Like, yeah. I mean, if I were to give you a short answer, which I try to do, but uh, I'm trying to conceptualize it. It's, I would say mm-hmm. it's as easy as the difference between just kind of idle thoughts throughout the day, eh, whatever. And then really seriously mm-hmm. trying to wrap your brain around something important. It's like the, the importance, is, oh, yeah. the, the importance yep. doesn't come from the dream as much as what the dream is expressing. So, yeah. Um, the, the, but to say a little bit more about that, um, if we are dreaming the entire night through, uh, and, and I was going somewhere else with it, um, assu- assuming we do dream it and I think we do, um, but we don't mm. remember, but, but different people have a different amount of recall. Like some people wake up every morning remembering amazing detail about long mm. dream sequences that felt like they lasted for years and that actually might have only been a five minute chunk of dream that felt because there's time dilation in dreams mm. as well. And the the feeling of how yeah. long they are, took to occur is not always the actual time it took to have that experience. Um, yeah. But then there's people like me and this is the full range of people who remember highly detailed, long sequences every day without fail. And then there's people like me. It is extremely rare. I ever wake up remembering I even had a dream. Uh, which some, mm. some people have said, is that why you're fascinated with dreams? Like partly. Yeah. I think it's a good, uh, a good, uh, assumption, but, but I'm also intrigued by the puzzle of it. Like, you know, and, and my, you, the satisfaction of solving that puzzle and, and providing some useful benefits to people. But, um, so if we go from there of like, so if you're one of those people who tends to remember, they dreamed more often than not. Most of mm. those are going to be kind of idle, mundane. I was thinking some things. Nothing really happened. Do I like chocolate yeah. better or mint chip? I don't know. Because well, sometimes you're like, what do I feel mm. like when I go to the store? So it, and there's there's buying the uh, buying a flavor of ice cream. Low, uh, low importance, uh, we, we might say. And yeah, then yeah. there's, mm. I need to decide what university to go to. And I only get one shot at that because I'm going to go there and that's where I'm going to spend four years and it's going to be very expensive. Big decisions that have long-term yeah. consequences. So I would say the dreams we wake up from that feel important, I, well, the way I phrase it is dreams self-select for importance. If you wake up feeling, wow, that left me feeling some kind of way intensely or that feels mm. like something I should understand, then it probably is. Um and and it's related to that the the significance of the of the ideas you were considering while it was happening. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. I don't know if that answers your question. What, at all. I'm all over the place. What there. do you think? <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, that does, that does. I, I just wanted to sort of quick uh, uh, just tack on to the end of that. Sure. Um, what do you and what do you uh, think affects? Like you spoke of like the twilight sort of zone of like when you, I guess when you sort of like yeah waking up and like your body's, I guess, getting reconnected to the brain or whatever. So like you can move and stuff because like I've had that, um, what was it? Hypnogogic is when you're going into sleep and yes, it no pompous is when you're coming out. Yeah. The hypnopompous one. I've, um, I've put holes in walls, like, cause oh. I've like been playing soccer and like, I'm going to kick the winning goal <laughs> in the game and my yeah. body's like, being wired back up to my brain and my knee has just like gone through the wall. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I've injured someone in like over the years. Yeah. And then there's, I mean, this, yeah. this touches on the, again, rather, scares the hell out of you. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, sure. And it touches on the rather still poorly understood idea of sleepwalking. We're not entirely sure what's going on there. Okay. So the, mm. the broad strokes on that are when we go to sleep and dream it, what, what our, body is programmed to do is disconnect from disconnect thoughts from volitional movements so that we Mm. don't walk in our sleep. Like that's what we don't want to do is be 
blind and deaf and walk off a cliff. Uh, so it, in, yeah. in, in, in the, in the uh, evolutionary sense, anyone who was kind of wired to be that way, they probably didn't survive and, and procreate. So what we were left oh. with is humans as they are today, which is when you go to sleep, it, it severs the connection between I think it and I do it. Now that yeah. gets, that's a little different with certain people and it's got to be biological. And they, again, they, uh, I don't think they've nailed it down exactly what it is, but mm. for some people that they're able to enter sleep, but then that discon that, uh, severing of the connection from, I think it, and I do it, it isn't broken. And so they get up and yeah. walk around and act out their dreams in their sleep. And then they're even, their eyes are open sometimes. It's the same with sleep talking, but just yeah. like it's your speech, like, uh, you know, uh, control cords that are sort of being like let yeah. turn back on sort of thing. Like, you know, you flick all the light switches off and somehow like you turn back on the yeah. thing. It like, it, can you actually take anything from what someone's saying in their sleep seriously at all? Or like, or can you interpret it a bit like a dream or um, is it just like sort of, you, cause you're only getting the speech. You're not getting any more context. Yeah. You don't know who they're There's talking like to. Not really much you can it. gain from it. And yeah. You, and you can't yeah. really interrogate them. Now, actually that has been, I'm just editing uh, a, new, a new book recently where there were some people <clears throat> who were able to be interrogated, so to speak. And, and that sounds bad, but mm. questioned during sleep and they would give answers. Yeah. And some of them said some pretty crazy shit that turned out to be true like what was happening at places far away at that exact moment. That's some sp spooky woo that I don't know what to do with. Um, yeah. That's a whole separate category, but you can actually kind of talk to people in their sleep and sometimes they'll interact with you. It may or may not mm. make sense. It, uh, you know, yeah. you, you, uh, you want to be careful what you ask because you might get answers that you don't want and are not true yeah. and you can't tell the difference and they will have no memory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wake up. Um, yeah. Uh, and they're going to be very confused as to why you're angry that when you that you said in your sleep that you want to sleep with her sister or something. It's a, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so um, sleep walking and sleep. Also, dream dolls flying, but I mean, you know, you don't think I can actually fly, right? Exactly. That's a good. That's a good. Good thing. Um, so sleep walking and sleep talking are or uh, what they call somnambulism and somniloquy. Um, somnus mm -hmm. being sleep and ambulate to walk or. Um, Lo lo loquus uh, to 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 speak um yep. there are also actually i mean a lot of different varieties of it there was a uh one episode of sleepwalking documented where like uh this was back in the day uh, rather poor folks uh or the you know two sisters shared a bed when they were young and one of the sisters got out of her bed in the middle of the night and thought she was using the chamber pot and just peed on the floor uh, I think it was one of the stories I read. Um, and then she, and then she got back into bed and woke up in the morning and they were, you know, uh, uh, they were both like what happened. Um, and then it, they didn't, it, this happened a few times until one of the sisters woke up and watched the other sister do it and tried to wake yeah. her up in the middle of it and couldn't, couldn't talk to her, couldn't get her to respond. Um, I think I'm telling the story right, but, uh, anyway, mm. that, that can be, it can happen in a lot of different, there, there are stories of people who, showed the most amazing physical abilities of balance and strength and, and like scaling the side of a house and walking the crest of a narrow roof and turning cartwheels and no, no, mm. no fear. Cause they don't know where they are and what they're doing. They're, they're not connected to the real danger, but also, mm. uh, but also successfully pulling it off like stuff that, you would you, you would blow your mind to see a, a circus acrobat do it and people are like you know documenting this um b by observation by re observational report you know if we take their word for it which i, yeah. I think most of these stories are not made up uh, as far as i know um but it at least jives with what, with what we know um it is possible um what you wouldn't get is maybe someone my age and weight and lack of um ability to do cartwheels doing cartwheels on the top of a house probably not going to happen but someone who had that mm. uh, roughly had that ability that, um had that ability yeah yeah no, the, and maybe they're just nailing it perfectly because like they are in a dream and like they don't have any like yeah. doubt in their ability in their dreams they're not like you know they're just doing it almost by like muscle memory in a way because like I, I sort of wonder how can you like, how can you walk in your sleep like while you're asleep you're not like your body may start just doing what you're doing in your head, but like, how do you still, um, I guess have 
Because it's like, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm getting it confused with like muscle memory. But um, well, there is yeah, there is a, something a, there is something to it there, and, and muscle memory works too. But also, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, t- t- training in a way, training is not the right word, but practice at something like someone who uh was a sleepwalker and had the ability to play the piano might walk downstairs and play the piano in their sleep. Someone who has never yep. been trained to play piano has never touched a piano in their life is unlikely to do that. Cause it's not within yeah. their, within their wheelhouse uh, of, of, of experience. Yep. Um, but you were also asking a- about, uh, um, the idea of falling asleep or coming out of sleep and how, so, okay. All of this just to get us around to the idea of, so w- what you're experiencing is a related condition. Um, you've probably heard about uh sleep paralysis if that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i found that quite interesting yeah yeah so that's actually the reverse problem of sleepwalking in some ways and i can't say we know physiologically why either one happens but if your mm. if your body is not disconnected from your brain while you're asleep you sleepwalk if your body mm. is not reconnected to your brain as you're waking up, you get sleep paralysis, which is yeah. a lack of voluntary control of your body. Cause that, whatever that connection is, hasn't been restored. So what a lot of mm. people describe as I, I felt as if a heavy weight was on my, something was sitting on my chest and I couldn't breathe is actually, yeah. it's actually the experience of being unable to draw a voluntary breath because you're on that automatic breathing with that happens when you're asleep. Mm. So people are like, oh, I couldn't take a breath. No, literally you couldn't. It's like when your leg falls asleep and you can't move the muscle. Um, that's yeah. pretty much what it yeah. is. You're not in control. You're not in charge of that at yeah. that time. Yeah. Now, now what causes people? It's, it's unsurprising. Got the dog wanted it in my lap and now he's wandering away. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Ah, screw you. Um, what's unsurprising is that people might panic, but what gives them a sense of, dread like like they're in danger what gives them a visual hallucination of a shadow or entity yeah because aliens are a lot of time sort of um involved in well like i don't i mean i don't believe in aliens but i believe people uh think that there's like aliens doing this to them a lot of time when like i personally think the we just got sleep paralysis and they're tripping. I, I don't could, know. Very well could be. No, I think there's there's something to that. What I would say is that we never heard about people being visited by aliens until aliens entered our lexicon. Until that concept. Yeah. You know, so what what you what people described in the past was demons, because that is a concept they understood. Oh, I was visited by ah, yeah. a succubus in my sleep that made me have a sexual dream mm-hmm. and nocturnal emission. Or I woke up and a demon was sitting on my chest and that's what caused me to be unable to breathe and to feel terror. Um, and, Mm. and some people may have, uh, very similar experiences and they end chalk it up to aliens. I saw a flash of light from outside the window and then I felt like I was flying, but I couldn't see anything. Mm. Yeah. 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 And now I'm not going to discount all stories. Like I'm willing to believe in psychic shit and I'm willing to believe in aliens. I'm just not sure. Yeah. It's not proven to me yet, but I, it's, I'm not going to say it ain't real uh, or that I can explain it away by, Oh, well we, that was just a dream. Okay. You can say, yeah, that. I'm, I'm, it? I don't I'm know. happy to, I'm happy to admit I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I'm like, whatever. That's mm. we'll figure it out uh, someday. I hope. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah, we'll find out eventually. Yep. Um. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I think that's all I got. You brought, um, you brought together your friends' questions. Are oh, you talking to a dream guy? Ask him about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very true. Very cool. Um, Very cool. Yeah, well, they've they've watched um, like so, uh, some of you videos as well. So they were like. Yeah. Well, while you're while you're there, uh, yeah. If you could ask this and this, um, uh, should we do the? Yeah. Uh, I was just make, I was just making oh. some making a note of the time on here because I'm going to go back and y'all cut out our ten minute break and that kind of thing. Um, but oh, cool, leave, cool. leave all the rest of it in. Uh, we're at about two and a half hours. Still not the longest episode I've ever done, so we're good. Um, oh whoa, are we? Right, I know. I like, thought since we're thinking like an hour and a half, maybe. <laughs> uh-huh. like, <laughs> I'm actually. I'm, and looking at the time yeah right time flies having fun it's good stuff um yeah. so did you uh settle on which dream you wanted to you wanted to tell me 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, I think I, I have, yep. Okay, good. Well, my, um, oh, excuse me. I'm not yawning at you. Uh, it's this, the cat just yawned and stretched and then he came over here and I'm like, you bastard. Now I got a social. Memory. Yawns are contagious. Yeah, yeah. Right. Social mimicry contagion. Um, so my basic process, I shut up and listen. You tell me the dream and then we'll uh, kind of go back through it again uh, and ask some questions yep. and then we'll try and figure out what it means. Yeah, cool. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so I'll start at the start of the dream, I guess. Um, Actually, is there a start of the dream? I I don't know. This, the dream doesn't really seem to start some... Well, I mean, it starts some... Like, from where I can remember from the start of it, um, I'm in a field, and it's like wheat or... Maybe not wheat. It's not like a crop or something. It's just like wild grass or something. Like, uh, But it's n maybe almost waist height, like it's sort of overgrown and like thick, but not thick enough that you can't easily walk through it and even run through it. It's like, you know, running through it's possible. And I can see off like in the distance looking in front of me, um, I, I can see like on the very horizon, it's like almost in, like you can only just sort of make it out, this grey sort of like silhouette, and but somehow I know it's a, a giant castle. And it's also my destination. It's like sort of the first moments of the dream. It's like I'm just I just pop into existence in this field. There's a castle in the distance, and I know I'm meant to be heading there. So I start like walking, um, and it's like really far away. Like I can't even guess how many miles. Like I, I don't even know how far like the human eye can see. But it's like super far. I know I've got like ages to go. So I'm like, well, walking's taking too long, so I just start running. And um, I'm running and running and running and running. And, like, I'm making progress. Like, I'm running as fast as I would in real life. Um, you know, I'm sort of like I've ran for maybe oh, half a mile or something like that before I start to see, like, something else coming up on the horizon, but much closer, like, this isn't, if you think about it, it's not like a perfectly flat plain. It's it's almost like hillish. So, like, it's there can be things that are obscured from, like, my sight, essentially. Um, and, yeah, as I come up over, like, a mound or, like, you know, whatever, I, I start to see this other thing. So it's much closer, and I'm getting close to it actually really fast um, to the point where, like, I'm almost at it. And so I slow down to, like, sort of a walk-type pace because it's a person standing there. And um, it's like this, I don't know, the word prone is right, like um, witch. No, maybe not a witch. I don't know if she was a witch. Not like she had a wand or something, but just sort of like a mean-looking old lady type thing, like sort of like the crazy cat lady from The Simpsons, if you're <laughs> familiar with The Simpsons. Um. Yeah, and she was just, like, she just looked, like, not evil, but she didn't look like she was there to give good advice. And as I'm walking up to her, I'm sort of, like, um, you know, staring at her, but, like, not walking towards her, but, you know, still walking forwards towards the castle type of thing. And she's, like, um, looking, just staring at me, essentially, and we're almost, like, level with each other as I'm going past her, and she, like, points at me, like, I don't know why, just to be creepy, I guess. But, like, she points at me and says, um, give up. The only way you'll get there is if you give up. And I'm like, that's, uh, I mean, I didn't say anything to her, I don't think. I, I think I just, like, sort of looked at her and just kept going. But I was thinking to myself, that's retarded. That makes no sense. You can't get somewhere by giving up. Like, if I stop right now, the castle is still just as far away. That's, that's so dumb. And so I keep, like, I just start running again. She's, she's like, she just stays standing where she is. And I uh, keep running, running, running. I'm looking forward. It's like I'm not actually getting any closer, though. Like, I feel like I'm, like, the castle just keeps, it's still, it feels like it's almost still just as far away, no matter how much I keep running. And I, I start looking back, and the old lady's getting further and further away. So, like, I know I'm still progressing forwards. And then... After a while, 
I come across her again, like pretty much this, like at first I don't realize, I think it's like another person, but as I get closer, it's the same, it's the same fucking prone. And I'm like, what, what is, what is going on here? Like, how did you, you could, like, how did you get in front of that? This doesn't make sense. And like, my brain was almost breaking from like, just how did you get here? Like, I'm thinking sort of like I'm being tricked or something. And like, I don't say anything to her. I just sort of like walk past, like, I guess with shock on my face or something, like, because I felt like my jaw was on the floor. I was just like truly confused. And she says the same thing to me. And I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm, this is, it's ridiculous advice. This is ridiculous. I've come across her again. Like, I'm just thinking how, like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and it happens like four or five more times. And like, at this point, I'm starting to get like, angry like i'm you know i'm not feeling like getting violent towards her every time i run past her but like i'm feeling more inclined towards violence each time i run past um but not that i I don't think i would have like attacked her but like well i mean i think yeah actually i don't know i'm not gonna think about that but anyway um (laughs) yeah so i'm getting more and more pissed off because I'm not getting anywhere. I actually keep running past her. The same shit keeps happening. And I'm just like, all right, now that I'm getting angrier, angrier until it, I don't know, just defeated me. I was just like, this is fucking stupid. I give up. And as soon as I said it, I was like in this giant castle hall, people like around this, like, I don't know, it looked like some sort of medieval sort of like giant long table thing, kind of like out of, um, I don't know, like Robin Hood style movies and stuff, I guess, like that sort of stereotypical, I, I guess, English castle sort of thing with a big feast hall or, or something along those lines. And, yeah, there's, like, you know, giant legs of meat and fruit and, like, it's just, there's a giant spread on. And just the noise, like, everyone's, like, chatting and laughing and, you know, there's people, like, you know, hitting their goblets together or whatever. Like, it's a party, essentially. Um, and, yeah, so, like, I just, I don't even think I grab a piece of food or anything before I wake up and just go, that was dumb. Until, yeah, I'd had the dream, like, maybe three or four times or something, and then I stopped having it. Because, like, I think I learnt its lesson, but I'm not sure, because I, I don't actually know if it had its lesson or whether it was just a funny dream. But um, but I think the lesson was like, yeah, essentially, you gotta. Sometimes you do have to give up to like get there or move forward or something. Like, it's it's it's, it's it feels like something like that. And I see it in like little areas of life, like over my life. I've like thought about it in respect to, you know, uh, when you're trying to like you you just forget what you were saying. It's on the tip of your tongue. And it seems as though the more you try and remember it, the f- the harder it is. Like, or like when you're looking for your car keys, the more frustrated you get, and the more you look, the less you can see them. And it's only when you give up, or you like trust your brain to just put it on the back burner and not focus on it anymore, that it will like just come to you like uh, in a flash. Like, oh, I, you almost in your mind see your car keys on the uh, on the um, shelf of the pantry or something retarded like that. Like. Or you'll, um, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it's, um, yeah, I see it a bit throughout my life. Like, um, or like, uh, if you're arguing with someone, like sometimes you just got to give up arguing with them and just give it time or space or something and it fixes itself. Like there's just so many, um, I guess things I can relate that to in life. And yeah, when I sort of took that as the meaning of that dream, I think I sort of like, Stop letting that shit ruin my day as often. As long as I remembered, like, and that's always the trick is you got to actually, so when I'm frantically looking for my car keys, getting, like, more and more worked up, the, the, yeah, as long as I remember, like, dude, just chill, like, go get a drink of water or something (laughs) and just don't think about it. Like, just don't worry. Find your car keys in, like, 20 minutes when you actually have to leave. Like, and I'll do that, sit on the couch with a glass of water, and, like, almost as soon as my ass hits the couch, it comes to me. Like, because I've, I've given up. I've stopped, like, struggling with it, I guess, or, yeah. Yeah. 
I I think that's a pretty reasonable um, understanding, for sure. Um, let me let me pick it. Um, make a little note here. Sorry. I'm getting better at taking notes. Um, I think we would have come around to a very similar um, understanding through through anything I could have uh, could have told you. Um, I think that's a good and and I would say the validity of that understanding is as as I've, I've said in the past the fact that the dreams stopped because they weren't necessary anymore that whatever 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 that lesson was you kind of got it it's something in that in that range of you're trying too hard you're making this harder than it needs to be sometimes you just got to back off mm. and let it be what it is um and that comes to us in a lot of in a lot of different ways um so in terms of finding that answer it sounds like you already kind of found it are you wondering more i was wondering if yeah, yeah. i was sort of wondering if like you see anything else and it's like it's to give um i guess a bit more um context or information that might sure. be important um i like so i was i don't want to say gifted child because it makes it sound like i'm blowing hot air up my own butt but um i was like you know i was a smart kid compared to um you know most kids sort of thing i like um always got really high scores and especially maths and science and stuff um because i found it really easy to learn like i just all i need to do is generally just read something once and i don't need to read it again i understand it the first time over and i can remember it and like so it was just e learning was super easy for, easy for me which was like massively detrimental to actually learning to do the hard work because if you can just remember you don't have to that's, do the hard work it's true um but your yeah, memory gets worse over time that's well, the, the and if, everything, tell you. if everything comes easy up to a certain point what do you do when something's suddenly hard yeah uh yeah yeah you don't handle it well yeah yeah <laughs> um but like so with the um yeah with the repetition of going past that old lady that kept trying to t t you know kept trying to teach me a lesson in quotation marks um yeah, the the it, repetition is like the one of the best ways to like um, yeah drive me insane. I think mm. until I take it as a slight against me, and then I'll just let the hate feed me. But um, <laughs> like yeah, I I just can't stand broken records essentially. And I, yeah, I think it's just because I just I just despise repetition. Like do these you know maths questions? I don't need to. I'm sorry, I just don't need to. I, yeah, I, um, I think like that could be maybe part of like, I don't know, maybe it was like, yeah, maybe it was trying to like teach me that I gotta listen to people sooner if I don't want to like keep butting my head against a brick wall or something, like, or maybe just at least consider what other people say because like. Being very smart also made me very arrogant. Yeah. So, like, I would generally think, like, I thought I was the smartest person in my family, like, most of my life, <laughs> including my parents. I think I'm smarter than my parents. Like, even <laughs> and this was from the age of about 13. I was like, I am, like, literally the smartest person on earth. Like, <laughs> way off, way off. But, like, um, yeah, that's essentially <laughs> sort of what I thought. So I wouldn't really give other people a chance when it came to trying to convince me of something or show me another side of something. I was, no, my ways, like, I I get this. I'm right. Don't worry. Like, yes, yeah. Yeah, I got you. And, you know, it's um, also entirely possible that you did have legitimately the highest IQ of anyone in your family. Um, which does not really equate to wisdom, experience, knowledge in that regard. Like there might've been people who are much better at other things. I know. Yeah. And that's, that can be hard for some. I wish I'd like that way right? younger. There's, there's, yeah, there's a very much a difference between, uh, you know, you know, uh, even knowledge and wisdom or, or even yeah. intellect, the, the capacity for not quick thinking necessarily, but, um, deep, um, like the capacity for thinking itself versus the application of it in, in a variety of contexts. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. So you might be a very fast learner, but there's still things you got to learn in, in that regard. Um, so uh, mm. 
you know, and, and none, none of what I'm, you know, none of discussing this would, would be to say that the conclusion you came to at all was, was incorrect. Cause I think you did hit the broad strokes that, that gave you at least the ability to say, well, I don't need, I don't need to see this in this form anymore, but there, I think there's some value to the idea of, of looking at it from different angles. Um, one thing you have mentioned is that banging your head on the brick wall uh, or or repetition, like a lot of these things are all very good. What, what occurred to my mind and what I wrote down um, was the idea of if you're trying the same method of resolution over and over again, running that circle circuit of trying to head towards a goal, but it's not getting you any closer because you're using the wrong mm. methodology. Sometimes you got to give up on that faster uh go okay, mm. get get the idea of this okay this isn't working let me try something else so it can be not just giving up but giving up on a particular method that isn't giving you yeah. results um which and and it's very interesting a lot of so you're conceptualizing this as you're in a you're in a you're in an outdoor space you're in a field there's grass it's kind of waist high so that's it's a very um what am i trying to say it it is the opposite of say a dense, deep, dark forest. where you got to navigate a lot of twists and turns. It's very different than mm. say a desert location that is devoid of green growing, you know, representations of life. You know, it's a very fertile field that has, that is very healthy for the grass. And uh, so there's, there's something to that there. Um, well, go ahead. It, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't quite scary, but it was like, um, it, it kind of looked like a sort of rolling hills of like Scotland or something. Sure. But if you made the grass less like green and chucked in a bit more yellow and the sky was sort of like gray and it was like, I feel like the, just the tones of it all was just like very like drab or something. But once I was inside the castle, it was like someone turned the contrast up, like all the fruit and stuff looked like, it was like it went from being like, I don't know, like, depressing to normal or something like or almost like a bit more vibrant than normal. Sure. Yeah. And there's, it's um, weird. what's I going to say about that? There's, there's a, um, there's, there's a bit of a flavor of say being lost at sea. And where, where am I going with that? If you're in the middle of the ocean, you have the complete freedom to go any direction, but everywhere you look is horizon. It's like too much, Mm. possibility. And so you actually, in the oh, way, yeah. what you see in the distance is a destination. So you've got the, the broader concept of what if I could do everything and I am, and I, what if I could do anything I want? The, 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 the great wide open, uh, the sky is wide open. The planes go on forever. I can go in any direction I want. Mm. Well, you, I, you identify a goal, whatever it is, the castle and you, you popped up in your why, yep. why in that form. Very interesting. We don't know. Um, but broadly speaking, it's, it's I love seems, Lego. Right, I don't know. And that may be part of it. You have a you have a fascination with uh, medieval times and uh, the Lego castle set. Yeah, 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 and you just you just love it, uh, castles so much. And it's interesting. And see, this is where part of this comes in. And we hold these ideas loosely too. I mentioned why a castle, and you said Lego. Okay, well, what is it to build a Lego castle? It's a it's a it's the idea of you've got a bucket full of pieces and what do you do with it? You invest your time and energy into make it something, a beautiful structure that the, the process of creating it is fun and the result is rewarding. It's a, it's a destination to aim towards uh, by a particular process, mm. process uh, sometimes following the instructions, sometimes making it up as you go. Cause why not? You know, whenever I did the Lego thing, when I was younger, mm. I always built the thing according to the instructions first just to see what they wanted it yep. to see, see what the Lego designers wanted it to be. And then I took it apart and built something else. <laughs> always, always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me. I was, I, I would like learn. So I would, I'd build it by the instruction booklet the first time. First time. Yeah. Yeah. And then essentially test, like I'd pull it all apart again and then test if I could do it without the instruction booklet. Uh -huh. And I generally could, like I generally didn't have to really look back at the instruction booklet much. Um, and if I could do that, then I'd take it apart again and then maybe do that another four times before I'd even think of make something else with it. Like I don't, cool. yeah, I don't think I got like the same thing out of Lego as most kids. Like most kids is for the imagination. Whereas me, it was like almost like taking apart a gun and putting it back together with a blindfold on or something. I feel Fair like it, 
a weird connection with it. In, I don't in know. some ways, there is there is no wrong way to enjoy something. Like, if the purpose is to achieve a feeling of enjoyment, then however you get it, if it's not hurting anybody, it's it's mm. all equally valid. I, I was definitely a little bit different as a kid. I would build it once by the instructions and never again. Never again. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, for me, I always wanted to make something different, uh, new. I would, yeah. ne- I've would. i never followed the instructions twice on, an, on anything in my life, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so you know and, and nothing wrong with that either either of our, our different methodologies but that that's very interesting too yeah. so so something about that some something very representative or a castle is very representative of that idea of building something maybe something something worth building something enjoyable to build uh, accomplishing something it's definitely a destination because mm. you're trying to get to it it is where you are destined it is the place you are trying to get mm. to um in in this dream sense and you you start off walking until you realize mm. wow i'm not making a lot of pros- progress as quickly as i might like and so there's something going on there where you you ha- you implement a method of moving you towards your goal literally walking in the direction of the thing you're trying to get to um mm you do a kind of reassessment in the process. How is my current process? Is it getting me where I want to go as quickly as I want it to? And that's one, one method of Mm. method of assessment is, is this an efficient method? And you're like, uh, okay, I'm going to adjust my process. You do a little self-evaluation of of, 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 of of what you're doing. Is this behavior accomplishing? No, let's try a different behavior. I'm going to run. I'm going to move faster towards that goal. And maybe that'll short shortcut this whole process. Because, you know, you, you weren't just out for a run. Mm. You weren't just running through the fields because you enjoyed feeling the grass tickle your thighs or whatever. That would be a different kind mm. of experience. Um, and once you committed to that enhanced effort or modified process that's where you Mm. then came across another kind of feedback that so there's there's different theories that sometimes objects or people in your dreams represent other people in your life oh yeah this one i I don't think it does i think it's more of an iconic stand-in for well, uh, the, 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 that's, what, I'm, go ahead. Yeah, uh, that's pretty accurate, actually. Um, now that I think about it, best, like, thing I can liken it to, uh, in my head is probably the, the witch with the red apple in the Disney, the, the old Disney, um, Snow White, I think it was, or was it Sleeping Beauty? Who had the apple? Was that uh, Snow White? I think that was Snow White. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the evil witch in that, um, that gives it to her she sort of like looked like that so yeah she was like essentially just generic bad old woman character because yeah. like my grandmas were beautiful women like my mom like i've got no like evil women in my life it was just i guess I, I, that's what i mean i don't know who, who it could represent i didn't have that sort of archetype or whatever in my life yeah. like i would only ever seen it in movies <laughs> Yeah, and it is it is an interesting form to put it in. And initially, you mentioned you know Crazy Cat Lady from The Simpsons, um, but but the archetype of the crone, the witch, the 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 wise old woman in the forest, in a way. And there's um, mm. and I haven't wrapped my brain my brain around this very well because uh, I'm gonna write a book someday, but I don't know. I haven't figured it out. So is it necessarily mm. that wizards are always men and witches are always women? Now that hasn't always been represented that way in pop culture, in in media, in different forms. There have been, um, uh, there's there's been, there is definitely the archetype of the witch in the forest, and there's mm. and and that's a, usually a more natural magic in tune with the earth, kind of the yin yang feminine style. And then uh, wizard, mm. wizards have always been a little more master of the element, master of the elements. Uh, lab secret laboratory working on potions although witches also do potions too they yeah. do witches brew so there's a lot of different ways and it all, a lot of it depends on like why would you need to see this message in that form why would you represent it to yourself that way so we could look at you know part part of it is what she looks like and the message to you um 
and she's she's very passive as well and like like she waits till you, she doesn't come to you she doesn't summon no. you to her she waits till you approach so you have to so there's um there's a message in there of not messages maybe the right there's a, there's an idea you're processing of like okay there you didn't have to stop and talk to her at all but you did something about mm. you made it um seem like a reasonable thing to do to consult this form and hear what it had to say um, cause you could have just ignored it and ran past it. Uh, you know, it could have shouted at you as you ran by. Um, it could have, it could have, uh, you could have had the experience of falling into a pit and the, the old woman and you knew it was her, she dug it and she came over to the edge and she, then she told you now that she's, she took the initiative to trap you. Then she gave you the message and let you out. You know, that, that would be a completely mm-hmm. different. So this is you identifying some other feature of the landscape that attract draws your attention. It's in a specific form. You decide to interact with it and attend to it and hear what it has to say. But what it tells Mm -hmm. you is stop trying. You know, the only way to get there is to give up, stop Mm -hmm. trying to reach your destination. So there's a reason you put that in her mouth. And also there's a reason why you ignored it. And you had to go through this mm. cycle. You had to kind of double, triple, quadruple down. And then, and each time getting angrier and angrier. So there's, there's some kind of a thing of like, what if I'm in a situation where I have a purpose? I'm taking reasonable, you have a goal I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm mm. doing what I think is reasonable to get there. And somewhere along the way, I get the idea that what I'm doing isn't working, but I don't want to believe it. Like I, I'm at least mm. in, in doubt with this intuitive sense that tells me, and maybe that's the whole idea of the woman is w- women. A lot of times in our, in our uh, understanding or pop culture or uh, who knows in our souls, uh, women are uh, assumed mm. to be a little more intuitive. Uh, so the idea of representing intuition itself by a female figure, certainly a, an older mm. female figure that maybe looks kind of, kind of like a witch, like a magic woman. Like maybe she, knows what she's talking about and you should probably listen something like that. Um, Mm. so you, so you have something, something along the way attracts your attention to the idea that maybe I should stop using this particular process and you ignore it. Like, no, 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 that can't be true. I, I know running towards this castle is the only way to get there. It has to be this specific method. Until you yeah. feel, until you keep returning. It's just not logical. If you stop, you can't get somewhere. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like no, the, and you did. Brain sort of thing. I was just like, no, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's not logical. And that's a very interesting dichotomy too, logic and intuition. You've got someone telling you something literally counterintuitive. How do you mm. go anywhere if you stand still? That's stupid. That's Alice in Wonderland level crazy. Um, yeah. and, and it is. Um, unless we conceptualize it as needing to give up on a process that was never going to work in the first place that is yeah. okay actually yeah you have to give up running because running is not going to get you there you got to do it this way mm. that is not this other way that is not running um but then it, it, the dream never really shows you a an alternative like well, what was i supposed to do and she didn't tell you to stop running she told you to give up completely which is oh yeah i know yeah, yeah. right right a little a little harder just, to and every time i go past her i feel like she's just sort of like um you know picking away at me like trying to wear me down more and more each time i go past like you don't need to keep yeah. repeating it if i've heard it once like why do you keep saying it's just, it, like yeah. either you're trying to wear me down I, like i was just i couldn't figure out what she like was trying to do apart from piss me off and yeah. like once i got pissed off enough i just pretty much like stopped and I wasn't tired. That was the sort of weird thing. I could sprint for like endlessly. I was sort of hot and sweaty and getting like agitated, but like, um, yeah, I, I'd never felt fatigued or tired or like felt like my lungs were burning or like uh, anything like that. So I probably could have run forever, but I just honestly didn't think I was going to make any progress. So yeah, I gave up like out of just, I don't know. I just, I was worn down. I was defeated. I was just like, yeah, no, fuck it. I guess guess I'm just not going to the castle. Like, whatever. Yeah. And then, yeah, just to be, and it was so confusing the first time I had that dream because, like, it was the worst possible message I could possibly think of, like, a dream trying to give me. Like, give up? Like, Jordan Peterson doesn't get up on the stage and say, you know what young men need to do? 
they need to give the fuck up more. Like, <laughs> that's terrible advice. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even talking about male suicide five minutes, you don't need telling them all to give up. Like, why yeah. would you say that? Like, it's one of those things where it's definitely good advice for specific circumstances. And I, yeah. And, and that's why I'm, I, I think and we might have. context. Hit... Which could have context. given me co- more context. She gave like, me Why didn't she say, I'm a magical witch and I'm going to teleport you there as soon as you give up? Like, yeah. What she's got to almost like, or hey, what do you got to lose? Try statistically, it, like, you know? not tell me, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah, actually, yeah, that that could be it, too. Yeah. I think I, th- I wanted to throw out a, a phrase to you and just get your you know, gut reaction of a, a free association style nagging yeah. doubt, nagging doubt. Does that feel you feel like anything? what's a word, nagging, oh, doubt. um, like, um. Does that phrase mean anything Not to you really? in terms of like conceptually? Like you know what a nagging doubt is? Like you can't shake this. A doubt that nags you, I guess. Yeah, but I, like I'm not familiar really with the phrase. Or, with the phrase. Like, I don't know if I've had one. Um, a nagging doubt. Like well, like something playing on your mind or like yeah, having like, like the idea a, of you, you make a decision or commit to a path and then for some reason you just can't shake the idea. Maybe this is a mistake. Am I really sure? And oh yeah, no, but yeah, you're, like no, but I but you're sure. Paralyzed with fear sometimes. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So maybe you don't have a nag- nagging doubts because all you have is doubts. <laughs> they don't nag at you. They're just they're right in your face. No, uh, no. It's like you said earlier with the open landscape. Like it's um, almost like a I'm paralyzed from like too much choice. Essentially, like yeah, my brain overloads deal. on trying to decide which is the right choice because there's too many and too many factors. Like I can't. Like I mean, over time, of course, I'm talking like when I was having when I first had this dream. I think I was like maybe. I don't know, eight years old or nine years old or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but I had it like a multiple, t- like maybe another, yeah, three or four times over the space of like up until I think the last time I had the dream was like maybe when I was like, say, 13 or something. I reckon around, yeah, sort of start of high school or something. It, okay. I figured, well, I don't know if I figured it out, but like I, I got some form of like thing out of it that obviously just made it go away or the testosterone or hormones or whatever like teenage <laughs> stuff i don't know what made it go away but like yeah i think you're, I think you're I, but having it multiple times sort of like yeah it was it sort of irked me as well because like after the first time each time i'd wake up from that dream i'd almost like be a bit pissed off that i didn't remember in the dream from the start of the dream all i gotta do is give up like that you've had I it before speed right? run that thing yeah, yeah. I, I could just speed run it now that I know the That's a very weird solution. That's like, a very weird thing about recurring dreams. Why don't we recognize them as recurring while they're happening? It feels like the first time mm, every time. That's a bizarre phenomenon. Um sometimes I will feel like I've been in a dream before, or it might just be the same mix of things from my past or my memory that get, are getting like, you know, smooshed together into this like almost like new environment, but just made up of like bits sure. of memory. Yeah. And there's, um, there's I, some dreams I do feel familiar. Like I, I'm like, Hey, yeah. I've been here before in a dream. I don't remember what I did, but like I've been here, I've been in this place. Like I recognize this. Like, yeah. yeah. And there's, I've had folks I'd talk to who are like, they asked me, have you ever had a person who say, says that every time they dream, they go to the same dream world that like, they might be in a different part of the world, but they know it's all connected. Like over here is the school. That's where I had Mm. one dream over here is a hill. That's where I had another dream over there is the ocean. That's where I had another dream. It's all the same. Oh, that's amazing. They have a dream map in their head. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And it's not, not mine, mine changes. I try that sometimes. Like I'll, I'll be like, I know where I am. But then I'll open a door and it leads down a hallway instead of like into a room. And I'm like, okay, that has changed. But other than that, this is all the same. And then I'll, it seems like the more I try and test that I like have been here, the more it changes. Like sure. it's, it's almost like my brain just goes, no, 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 no. Like you're not, you're not so easy. In I, don't your, know. In I, your, I feel like it's, I'm messing with myself a lot. In your daily life, do you find yourself relying more on logic or on in, just going with your gut on intuition? Um, a mixture of both, but probably more intuition, I guess. Yeah. Do you, were like you, I wing, I wing it a lot. I guess this. Sure. It, yeah. Do you, were you that way when you were a kid too? When you, you know, back eight to thirteen ish or so, or, or were you more in, um, intellectualizing? No. Things? intellectualizing and trying to think of things logically and things had to make sense for me to let them go almost like I'd almost get 
like like a dog with a bone until I'd understand something and I'd only let it go once I'd understood it. And not only that, actually, but I felt like to properly understand anything, you need to know everything from the foundation, oh. even the things that didn't work, the things that did work. Like, so that's why I loved mathematics because that's, like, that's the foundation of science. That's the foundation yeah. of, like, well, I mean, you got sort of, like, logic and philosophy below that. Like, I didn't know that at the time, but... I saw maths as like the la pura lingua, like it's it's the pure language. Yeah, you sound and a lot, you sound a lot like me good, in that, in that, in that description. <laughs> I'm, pretty, oh, really? I'm pretty obsessive with understanding things. Yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. Um, but this may have been a turning point in your life where you you confronted the need to let go of the pure intellect side of things and the, the obsession with understanding and lean on trusting your gut a little bit more that sometimes your gut will mm. tell you. And even if it pisses you off, it'll tell you you're wasting your time. Knock that off. Don't, don't do that. And you, you got to listen to it. That might be the lady telling you this, this path is not working. And what you had to do at the time was l run that loop a few more times until you started getting more and more frustrated with the, the fact that you couldn't shake the intuition, it kept coming back. It was always ahead of you waiting for you again. And you're like, what this mm. bitch, what's happening? There she is again. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I think that may have been a turning point for you back then where you, where you kind of had to confront the need to rebalance a little bit and maybe even acknowledging this, this, you know, it, it's like, what am I trying to say? It's a set that contains other subsets. So, you had a dream that was speaking to a current struggle that was then going to show you how to handle future struggles that were similar. Is that making mm. any sense? Yeah, totally. Cause like okay. once I sort of like decided I, you know, found enough meaning in it, I guess that I didn't have to have the dream anymore. I, um, yeah, it's like my life going forward. I, I found heaps of, um, like really, uh, relatable sort of um you know i've pulled some really relatable things out of life like yeah uh, like when it comes to you know when people are looking for their glasses it's not till they actually like sort of stop looking for them that they'll find them on their head most of the time i don't wear glasses but i laugh at people with their glasses on their head looking for them um but yeah there's like so many sort of like times in life where i've been able to apply that yeah you you've got to give up to like get there or, or like you've got to give up something to get something or you've got to learn to let it go like there's just a yeah. i can draw like yeah, a million sort of like little nuggets of wisdom out of it um that i well that i have sort of i'm not drawn out of it but i always relate it back to that thing like type of thing it's just sort of like where i you know how i said like i, I like to learn things sort of like from the ground up i almost treat that dream as the ground up of like anything i i can relate to that yeah um so it's like I'm building on that. It's almost like I'm building on that dream with, like, finding concepts in the real world that can, I don't know, legitimize it or something maybe. But, yeah. Yeah. And then the kind of the, the moment of acceptance, some kind of way, I mean, describe it as so you're, it felt like your brain broke in that sense and, and that you were confused. Um you know, it, the, the idea of coming across her again, it's like, I, this shouldn't be, it's like what I'm doing should be working. And that there's, there's a, there's an experience mm. we have where we realize what we're doing isn't working and we're confused. I'm like, I was so sure this was the right way. And we get to a point where we kind of, kind of confront, wait a minute, I'm back at the beginning again. Why this, I haven't made any progress. Why isn't this working? And I think the longer we perseverate on that kind of stuff, as, as you describe in the dream, the more pissed off we get is like, this should be working. Mm. What the hell? This, this is the right, mm. I know this is the right way. And okay. So I have a video game experience that, um, happens to me occasionally. And, uh, let's say I need to accomplish something in a game and mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how to do it. And actually I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to do. What if I'm supposed to try to jump from here to over there? And then I do it maybe a dozen or more times, two dozen, five dozen times. And Mm. I get more and more frustrated each time. And what drives me crazy more than anything is I don't know whether what I'm trying to do is impossible because I'm not supposed to do that. 
Like I was never yes, meant I was yeah. never meant to jump over there. Or am yeah, I just yeah. doing am I just incompetent and I'm doing it poorly, even though that is exactly where I'm supposed to go. So sometimes just settling that question, am I wasting my time? Is this a waste of time? Am I stupid? What, what am I doing here? Mm. Am I supposed and then sometimes uh if if I've got someone in the chat, they'll say, Yeah, don't do that. That's not the way to go. I'm like, oh God, thank you for saving me all this time and energy yeah, and trying to yeah. jump this gap that I was never going to be able to get across, no matter how perfectly I did it. Some games can be, yeah, sort of like a little uh, vague on where yeah. you're meant to go sometimes. Yeah. So you're just meant to sort of like intuit it. And because like the game designers have like ran through the game a million times, they design it as well. Like they, they yeah. sort of see it as the obvious thing. Like, yeah, if you ran past this bunch of trees and you're on this path, why wouldn't you think you go over here? Well, because there's like, it's intuitive to you because you know you're meant to, but like to yeah. someone just playing it, like you could go over there or you could try and jump to those rocks over there. Like, which way is it? It's not For obvious, sure. like to someone just facing it, and which I think is a part of designing games, like to try and lead, like, yeah, you know, that is a part of it to try and make it naturally lead you somewhere. Give people and I think like, that sometimes cues. they, yeah. yeah, yeah, environmental cues. Like if you're meant to scramble up this wall or something, there'll be like a little bit of white paint or something, like just to make yeah. it clear that you can scramble on that wall type of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, it, it, most of the time in a lot of these circumstances, I just kind of, I chalk it up to me. Like I'm just n not as observant as I should be. Like maybe it should have been obvious. Like once I kind of get it, I'm like, why didn't I see that before? Of course, of course that was right in front of me, but I, I didn't, I didn't mm. see it. I was trying to jump on the rocks and that was not the way to go at all. <laughs> so, but, mm. um, mm. I, I would suppose the, um, the final thing to say about all this is about being inside the castle. And it is an interesting thing that like, you know, when you finally felt accepted the feeling of defeat, like until a particular moment in the dream, like until we, until we accept that what we're doing isn't working. I mean, and that is a magical switch that flips sometimes. Um, it's, it's, uh, what am I trying to, it's like, a. it's like someone, uh, let's say someone's an alcoholic. They don't mm. get help until they hit rock bottom, whatever that is for them and realize this is a mistake. This isn't working. I mm. can't keep living like this. Now that doesn't mean all the problems are solved and they, you know, uh, are magically healed by the faith of Jesus or whatever, but that's the turning yeah. point. Like until that moment of acceptance in some ways, nothing changes. That's like the literal beginning of, of all possible future change. So there, there was something like that going on there when you had to, when you felt, you finally felt or accepted the feeling of defeat of like, this is not working. You would kind of admit it to yourself. Then, yeah almost magically now you're in suddenly in the teleported into the castle, like almost instantaneously it changes mm. the entire landscape, the entire experience of the dream. Um, and now what you've got is in front of you, a, uh, a celebration, a feast, uh, you know, yeah. delicious food, happy people. Um, almost like, uh, almost like a video game in that regard of like, once you finally make it to the castle at the end, then you see, you know, and the credits roll and everyone's having a feast and that's, that's the up, yeah. that's the up note on a good, uh, on a happy story, uh, the happy ending of the story, so to speak. And everyone lived happily ever after. Um, unless. Yeah, you totally. Cause like it almost served no purpose, but to say, well, you got it. You got the, you won the end. Like, cause I didn't get to actually yeah, nothing enjoy happened. myself there or anything, yeah. but like there was still a satisfaction in like getting there, but it still felt sort of like at the time hollow because like I felt as though by doing the wrong thing, I won. And that still felt sort of like it didn't really make sense until I sort of like yeah. thought about it enough, I guess. Well, it, and, and as you were saying too, is like, there's like, a it was more nuanced than I guess on my first take, like, yeah. Yeah, well, well the, also, what the old the, lady was saying. I mean. There's just a little bit more too in, in, in regards of sometimes the only way to win is to stop fighting in a way. And if you think about that relationship wise with mm. people, like your purpose maybe is not to, we were talking about debates earlier. The purpose maybe with, mm. with a given interaction is not to have the other person confess you are correct and they were wrong. Maybe the purpose was to have a nice conversation and maintain the friendship. So sometimes Mm. pushing for the wrong goal def 
you, until you give up or accept defeat that that goal is not one you should want to attain or one that is likely to be satisfying if you do obtain it uh, until you g- mm. give up again another circumstance of the wrong path g- give up on the wrong path in order to actually have a victory worth having um this that was one one thing i wanted to mention but then just the broader idea of uh you know again this is happening when you're like 8 to 13 years old you may not have known what comes next after after you get so let's say you're having this this experience of what if i'm making the wrong decision and i'm not sure but over time i'm shown you know I, but i have a feeling that it might be the wrong path and over time i'm it's confirmed i've had enough repetitions to know okay this is not working and i finally give up on the wrong path well what next what, what, then what do i do and the only thing you could show yourself was well then you're in a place with happy people who are having lots of delicious food and um you know, it's a little, a little victory celebration yeah. It doesn't matter where you are, you're not running anymore, which is like uh, a relief. Yeah. And it is very in- uh, interesting that you chose to show yourself that the that the uh, accepting the need for surrender was, was what was the condition for victory uh, in this specific scenario. Mm. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can like yeah, I can relate it to just way too much stuff in my life. But um, <laughs> I feel also like it helps me with um, because that was when I was a, you know, a kid slash teenager. But then um, when I got into like my early twenties and started to experiment with like hallucinogens and stuff, ah. um, it's like it's always I uh, I I think I've just been very lucky in the way that um, like most people can't handle hallucinogens and i don't mean that in a slight against most people i just mean most people can't deal with the ego death they freak the freak out like yeah when they're losing control over like they feel like well when you're hallucinating (laughs) hallucinating you kind of are losing control like you can't be expected to like you can't drive a motor vehicle while you're tripping balls like yeah if the sky is melting and it's like changing color and stuff don't get behind the wheel of a car but you know i yeah, I, I don't like that. That ego death doesn't like um, it doesn't ever scare me at all or anything like that. Like I, I spent yeah most of my twenties experimenting with um, different states of mind, I guess, and like sure, yeah, just sort of. I've always found dreams really fascinating, and I think that's also why I've found um, like hallucinogens and other drugs um, fascinating, at least to try. Like um. Luckily, I've been more interested in them almost like from a scientific point of view or an ex- like an experience point of view rather than as a, um, like to, a, like, I think that's what's prevented me from abusing them essentially or becoming addicted because, like, I'm not really taking the drug to mask something or anything. It's realistically more for the experience and to see if I can sort of, like, I don't know, just, like, bend my brain in a different way to just like i feel like so many times i've been on mushrooms or lsd and i've had like crazy epiphanies like about life like especially mushrooms they 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 they, for some reason peel back this like veil and i can see how just absolutely absurd reality is it's just like almost like hysterically funny how just like absurd it is and there's all these people around the world being so serious, taking life so seriously. When it's just a joke, it's just one big joke. We're meant to be having a good time and laughing, not like worrying about oh my mortgage payment and all this sort of shit. It's it, I don't know. I, I see this absurdness in the universe, and like I I think um like dreams are definitely much more interesting than um like drug experiences because drug experiences are very similar like if you know like the experience like each time is is very similar whereas dreams are like wild if they can be yeah crazy you can be get, getting chased in it or you can be like uh flying or you can be like on another planet or you can just there's literally anything can happen oh, i yeah. don't think like i don't think hallucinogens can even I'm close to it, except for maybe DMT, and even still, DMT can't do what dreams can do. I think. Yeah, 
No, oh, sorry, Joe sure. Rogan, if he's listening. Sorry, Joe. No offense, but yeah, <laughs> DMT <laughs> is awesome. Lots of fun. Only for the brave, but it's yeah, it's uh, you know, this dreams are yeah better. Yeah. And it is very interesting that dreams, outside of specifically recurring dreams, they're all different, like wildly different. You never, mm. you never, you never know what's mm. going to happen. You can't predict them. Uh, they are what they are. Why, why those images in, in that shape and uh, time? Uh, who knows? And you, can, yeah, it just that the un- mm. unpredictable, wildly different nature of them is, makes it fascinating. That's why you know you're not the first person ever to say, "Well, I don't know if my dream is very interesting." I, I hope you, you know, they're not. You're not bored. And I'm like, no, they're all fascinating. There's never been a boring dream. I've never, never heard a boring dream in my life. <laughs> they're all very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you feel like we had a pretty good uh, discussion around it? You got uh, maybe some additional, yeah, uh, that was uh, awesome, yeah, additional layers of perspective in a way. Um, yeah, I, definitely, definitely, yeah. Yeah, as I said, I don't think I would have come to any different conclusion. I think maybe even starting with your rough understanding gave us a great jumping springboard right into uh, okay, let's let's go with that and see how the different elements kind of build up to it uh, to to that understanding. Mm. Yeah, I think it all. I think it all makes great sense i think you were always on to something there yeah well i mean it, it didn't happen like overnight but like yeah after like long enough eventually i yeah started to i don't know at least pull something out of it yeah, yeah for sure well good deal if you think we got something of value for you then uh, you want to wrap it up yeah definitely yeah Good deal. Okay, then we'll do this. I will say once again to our friend Milkman Dan from an island off the south coast of Australia sharing beachfront property with the penguins. I love saying that. It's fantastic. Um, uh, So, uh, and for my part, would you kindly like, share, subscribe? Always need more uh, subscribers, volunteer dreamers, uh, viewers for the video game streams, all of the above. 16 currently available works of historical dream literature, the most recent dreams and their meanings by Horace G. Hutchinson. Uh, Very busy working on book 17 and the audiobook release. Uh, as well. Um, all this and more at Benjamin, the dream uh, including MP3 downloadable versions of this, uh, very, uh, in- interview podcast. Um, uh, also Benjamin, the dream uh, where you will, uh, find, uh, some, oh, very often you will find the secret recipe for the themed cocktails that go with my video game streams. Uh, most recent was the dream wizard, uh, Dream Wizards Fireball Cider, and before that was the uh, the Gin Ricky uh, when I was playing Bioshock. So uh, who knows what I'm uh, going to come up with next? Uh, but you definitely want to head over there and find out. So with all that said and done, rambled longer than I thought I would. Uh, Dan, thanks for reaching out, and I'm I'm glad you were able to join me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good deal. It's been a pleasure. And everybody out there, thanks for listening. <laughs>